Always B B C closing. Always be closing. Always be clo closing. After the frenetic Oliver Stone directed start to Money Night Extravaganza, where we talked about Wall Street, perhaps Glen Gary Glen Ross was almost quaint with the contained size. Rather than the towering and vast spaces of New York City, the setting of Glen Gary Glen Ross could really be anywhere. When Mammoth debuted the stage play in 1983, opening in London and then the 374 show of Broadway run. He already debuted his trio of off-Broadway plays that propelled him to prominence. The Duck Variations, Sexual Perversity in Chicago, and then American Buffalo. In fact, American Buffalo had opened for yet another run in 1983, meaning that it was going on simultaneously with Glen Gary Glen Ross. And this run starred Al Pacino as Teach. Pacino wanted to star in Glen Gary Glen Ross, but his American Buffalo schedule prevented him. And so he told David Mamet that if he ever did it as a movie, Pacino would star. In 1984, David Mamet won the Pulitzer Prize for the stage play. It was hailed as a triumph of ensemble acting. While it was going on as a play, the offer started coming in to turn it into a film. Jerry Tukovsky and Stanley R. Zupnik, B-movie producers looking for a bigger, more profitable project, contacted Mamet. Mamet wanted to make sure he wrote the screenplay, and for $1 million, sold them both the rights and wrote a film adaptation for them. By 1992, when the film adaptation came out, David Mamet was an accomplished screenwriter and director. Having written films like The Postman Always Rings Twice, The Untouchables, and the Academy Award-nominated screenplay The Verdict, he directed films like Things Change and Homicide in 1991. James Foley was picked to direct Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, with David Mamet just focusing on the screenplay, which I think was an excellent decision. Put me out of my misery. It taught me something, John. What it taught me? You gotta get out there. I'm not cut out to be a thief. I'm cut out to be a salesman, and I am back. I got my balls back. Now, you got a slight advantage on me. <laughs> the film feels more like a stage play, especially in the second half. The cast, Al Pacino, fulfilling his pledge to Scar, Jack Lemmon, Ed Harris, Kevin Spacey, and Alan Arkin were all accomplished stage and screen actors. I don't got to listen to this shit. You certainly don't, pal, because the good news is you're fired. The bad news is you've got all you've got just one week to regain your job, starting with tonight. Starting with tonight's sit. A role that wasn't originally in the play, a new monologue, was written for the film adaptation and given to Alec Baldwin, which became one of the most famous scenes in the movie. The inciting scene of the film, where Baldwin as a top salesman named Blake, is sent by the real estate company Mitch and Murray to try to inspire their struggling office. You can't close the leads you're given. You can't close shit. You are shit. Hit the bricks, pal, and beat it, because you are going out. The leads are weak. The leads are weak. The fucking leads are weak. You are weak. 
Blake declares a couple day contest where the highest sales will get a Cadillac and the lowest sales are getting fired. At the end of the contest, Kevin Spacey's John Williamson, the office manager, will hand out leads for the Glengarry Highlands development as opposed to the less promising Glen Ross Farms, a much more lucrative batch of prospects than the old ones that are currently being used. In a lesser movie, you'd probably have a rat race style competition for the most sales, but Mammoth doesn't even really flirt with that. Instead, Glengarry Glen Ross is a drama about the deceitful and cutthroat nature of the real estate business. Not because of the competition between individual real estate salesmen, but because many of the leads aren't even in the financial position to invest in land. Jack Lemon plays Shelly the Machine Levine. 50% of all my sales. What sales? What say? By God, I just closed 82 grand. Are you out of your fucking mind? I'm back. This is just the beginning. Just the beginning? Where have you been, so Shelly? A Willie Loman like tragic character. Long past his prime, with a sick daughter and a string of bad luck. The other two struggling real estate salespeople, David George, played by Ed Harris and Alan Arkin, struggle to even close anything with bum leads. And no group to even try to get back. You, Williamson, I'm talking to you, shithead. You just cost me six thousand dollars. Six thousand dollars and one Cadillac. That's right. What are you gonna do about it? The top closer, Richard Roma, played by Al Pacino, is head and shoulders above the rest of them, but is also the most deceitful. The constant failure and nonstop pressure gets to everyone, which sets up the second part of the film. Well, I think I had one once. You had one, you know. I tell. They keep coming up. I don't know. They like to talk to salesmen. Something they're lonely. I don't know. They like to feel superior. Never bought a fucking thing. I don't know. Come down the line. Doctors, lawyers, Indians. Times are tight. It's tight. The office is robbed. But what's taken from the manager's office is the good Glengarry lead, which can be sold to other companies. The first half of the movie is more spacious and was more expensive to shoot as it's raining the whole time, which required rain machines. The second half is more like a play. The staging all takes place in the office. And that's where allowing David Mamet to adapt his own stage play was the most brilliant. The floor of the office is our location for the entirety of the second half. Characters walk in and out with impeccable staging. Glen Gary Glen Ross has definite echoes of Arthur Miller's famous death of a salesman. Something Mamet and the cast would joke about. Play and film are laced with constant profanity, so they'd call it Death of a Fucking Salesman. Death of a Salesman and 12 Angry Men off the top of my head are two stage plays turned films in a contained space showing it can be done and I think there's inspiration for both of them here. The way the camera uses the room reminded me of watching 12 Angry Men in school. Glenn Gary Glenn Ross starts off allowing the action to roam around. A crucial plan to steal the leads happens in a restaurant with Ed Harris trying to convince Alan Arkin to steal the leads. Even this scene though uses an interesting form of stage play staging. At the same time Richard Roma also sells an expensive property to a shy and secure middle-aged man named James Link played by Jonathan Price in a restaurant. And we see Shelley Levine make a pathetic sales visit to a house. How can you present investment opportunities without television, without magazine ads? I said, you take something this good, you go to a man has invested in the past, you go to him direct and offer the money to him. Rebate! And don't give it to this expert. Huh? So you're here to sell me some land? No, I wouldn't try to sell you. I leave that to the salesman, you know. Which uses similar staging tricks, containing itself in the space even when it doesn't have to. The jump to the second day traps us in the office. A cop shows up to interview each salesman, giving us plenty of flow in and out of the office. It's really quite an impressive feat and deservedly seen as one of the best 90s films. Where did you learn your trade, you stupid fucking cunt, you idiot? Whoever told you that you could work with men? Could I? Oh, I'm going to have your job, shithead. I'm going downtown. I'm going to talk to Mitch and Murray. I'm going to Lemkin. I don't care whose nephew you are, who you know, whose dick you're sucking up. Tonight's show is brought to you by Yabiga. A Balkan Rockia spirit. Go to yabiga.com to order a bottle tonight. Anyway, before I introduce the panel, please like this video and subscribe to the Movie Night Extravaganza YouTube channel. Hit that bell to get notified whenever we're streaming. Also, we are now monetized, so if you have any pressing questions during this live stream, send us a super chat, which helps me keep the show running, and which I am obligated by international law, human rights law, to answer. We also have a Patreon, patreon.com slash movie night extra. All of our after parties are on there forever. We also have a new Discord and a Letterboxd HQ account, so those are two more places to follow along with us. Links are in the description. Okay, let me introduce the panel. Conan Neutron, host of Bretonic Reversal, 
co-host of Movie Night Extravaganza and frontman for Conan Neutron and the Secret Friends, neutronfriends.bandcamp.com. Conan Neutron and the Secret Friends has a new split LP with Lung, Adult Prom, available now on Bandcamp. Christina Oaks is streaming on Twitch at Cosmopolitics, twitch.tv slash Cosmopolitics. Also recently joined YouTube, she's on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Cosmopolitics. Send her some subs on Twitch, and send her a coffee. J. Andrew World, illustrator, book cover artist, artist for Give Them an Argument, co-host for Movie Night Extravaganza, and Bad Takes. K.T. Baldessaro is an actress, director, and writer who co-wrote and directed and also starred in Girl in the Basement, along with appearing in quite a few horror movies. You can also catch her voice acting in the scripted podcast series, The Starwell Foundation, an audio drama set in the city of superheroes, wherever podcasts are listened to, and her new film podcast, What If I Don't Like It? New episodes bi-monthly. I, of course, am your host, who has been sent down from Mitch and Murray to teach you how to do the plugs, Forrest Miller. A for always, B, B, S, streaming. Always be streaming. Uh, fun, fun fact. I knew of the play before the film because of the 2007 revival with like Lee Schreiber. I think he won uh, a Tony Award for it. And then Jonathan Price, who's in this film, did the revival in London. Nice. There was a, there was a later revival that uh, Al Pacino did as well. And he was on there. I, I did see it. This is actually one of the few plays I've actually seen in a theater, like electively, not like going as like a school trip or something. Yeah. Uh, but it was not with Al Pacino. But it, it was really cool because. Wait, where, where was it? Where, like, where did it, you it, In it? San Francisco. Oh, and cool. it was. Um, it was interesting that how different the actors made a difference like how, how different uh the, the people playing the roles like really? like it was almost like yeah even though it was like i know this movie like the back of my hand i've seen it like so many goddamn times uh, and, and by the way any and all cursing is encouraged on this stream because <laughs> it was in the spirit of, of the movie uh but well, did the but play like have- the, every every one of the roles except for one was like just kind of different. It's the only way that I can really describe it. Like I don't really yeah. have a lexicon. To the, does the play it. have more riffing on uh, Indian Indians than answer the phone? Is that like there, a- uh, that, there, there was a controversy about that actually. Yeah, because uh, the, 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 the play the play has a lot more. From what I know, has a lot more riffing on like the whole like Indians that answer the phone, the Patel yeah. thing, and they cut that down by a lot. I mean, they might have cut it down in, in future, uh, you know. The- what a progressive movie. <laughs> it's Well, it's David Mamet. I mean, like, yeah. dude is as smart as can be, but he's never going to be mistaken for a progressive lion. <laughs> I, I wonder if it's almost a bit like 12 Angry Men. I know that you were saying in the intro, it feels yeah. a lot like 12 Angry Men. But when you see a production of 12 Angry Men, it does deeply depend on who is Who's playing playing whom, even if you've seen it a bunch of times before. This movie only has five angry men, so that's the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, but it definitely is men talking. But they're loud enough for 12, so, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Unlike yeah. women talking. Well, so something I found interesting is that the original play, um, you know, Al Pacino was approached about starring in the actual play. And really then um, and then he was in American Buffalo, which is David Mamet's other play that was still going at that time. Yeah. And he couldn't do both at the same time, but he wanted to star in it. And it's kind of interesting that he already had that working relationship um there's, there's also uh there were, they were they were talking about maybe hiring alec baldwin to be the richard roma role um because so al pacino crazy. kept uh because al pacino had like sense of a woman came out the same year and he kept on like leaving all these productions to you know do other things and he was doing his frenetic al pacino thing he won, a, he won an oscar for scent of a woman too right mm-hmm. yeah yeah i don't mm-hmm. like that one. Oh, <laughs> the tango is my, I it's, did it's, my it's wedding like, dance to the tango from that it's fine. Whatever. Is, is it's, it's, like not, it's not like odious or anything, but like the fact that, like, look, I think he won for Scent of a Woman he, he, because, like, they didn't give it to him for, like, you know, whatever, for, like, Godfather and for, you know, like, all, all these movie. other great roles. It's, it's like when they're going to get Glenn Close to the Oscar for the movie musical adaptation of Sunset Boulevard. It's going to feel like that because <laughs> she's been nominated how many right. times and never won I know. Oscar? Yeah, that's true. That is true. It's like, happen. Like, wait, Just wait. give it to her already. <laughs> give her <laughs> one. <laughs> We love, I did. Loves it. That, we love the way you smelled that woman. We're going to give you an exactly. answer. <laughs> I did just see Pacino oh, in, <laughs> in Knox Goes Away, which is Michael Keaton's directorial debut. And he oh, was yeah. really subtle. He's not doing the Pacino Pacino anymore. <laughs> it's It starts to, his hair is like doing something. I don't know. But he actually pulled it back a little. Because we were saying, is this the yeah, last movie you know, before he becomes a caricature right. of himself? 
Well, he's been right, right, because you know that hua, you know that that yeah. the Al Pacino, right? Like, which yeah. I love Heat. He's great, but it's definitely like sort of like the ground zero of like, okay, he settled into this thing. This is the thing that he's doing here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and and but like, there's things like Hunters and stuff where he does do a really good quiet performance. He's in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, and like, as his role is great, and it's like very yeah. as a very quiet. His role, uh, his you know? role as Phil Spector was very loud because I'm like Phil Spector was a very soft spoken guy, but you have him doing Phil Spector, and it's really loud and weird. And Phil like, Spector. Yeah, well, even even uh, <laughs> the, the Irishman. Sound going. I think he's, even the Irishman, right? Like he gets loud throughout that performance, but mm -hmm. his Jimmy yeah. Hoffa performance is a lot more muted in a lot of ways. Like he's not he's not full blown. Pacino until he gets on that stage and starts yeah. yelling solidarity at everybody. We're gonna have a great strike. Yeah. He has a patois about him. It's almost like Christopher Walken. But then remember when you saw Christopher Walken in Dune Two and he didn't talk in his Walken accent and it yeah. felt a little weird. People, yeah. people were like, "This role was miscast for sure." And I'm like, "Okay, whatever you say." Okay, but let's talk about let's go back yeah. to this movie because I think that yeah. it's. We, we and that's on me this time because I immediately had to talk trash about Scent of Woman. But like, whoa, this, that woman, she smells. Whoa, <laughs> Who <are> this <laughs> is like a master class of acting. Like everybody in here is, is yeah. like, uh, first and, of all, everybody has something cool to do as long as they're dudes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that woman that, you know that woman that took no uh, women Jack talking coat. here. What the hell? This movie's well, sexist. That, that, that one Chinese woman that took uh, Jack Lemmon's coat. She right, she right, had, right. Uh, she was keeping that coat for him the whole movie. <laughs> but like phone calls, I don't know. But you can tell. I mean, David Mamet, like his old his. I think it's the whole thing he was saying. And granted, he didn't direct this one, but this is the, he. He obviously wrote it, and I, it's. I think one of the best iterations of his work is this adaptation specifically. But like his ideal actors and actresses are people that just like read the lines, right? And peace and love, like Rebecca Pigeon, like who he's, he's married to, and I, I like her, but like that's like his ideal person to be like acting is Rebecca Pigeon, and like mm -hmm. I don't know how uh, who else has like seen all of the various David Mamet movies, but there's some stuff she's great in, and some stuff it's like no, you're definitely reading the lines, and that mm -hmm. is literally all you're doing. Well, and it's, it's really is, a naturalistic yeah. dialogue for her to wind up re like. How do you not know? Eh. I do to be care to be fair, I, I need to be clear. I do like Rebecca Pigeon, but she, mm -hmm. she's not what you call a dynamic actress. Or yeah. I wouldn't anyway. Mm -hmm. It's not her vibe. And his dialogue uh, is very dynamic, is what I'm saying. And look, you got Alan Arkin, you got Ed Harris, you got Jack goddamn Lemon in like this. I mean, this is like he how many movies did that dude do? He did so mm -hmm. many and so many different types, styles, and varieties. But he does something in here that's so unique and so heartrending and just like oh like it's I, they don't show that in acting class they probably show the album a bit but Ooh, like, we I, have I a know fan of the movie here. in my chat by the way endless cemetery thank you for the raid apparently big fan of this movie yeah there you go nice there you go. yeah well there, first yes. was saying before um about why like what Baldwin did to to Lemon in certain scenes to get him to have that level of emotional response. And you see in his eyes all of this like intense level of acting. Yeah. It's really impressive. Yeah, he, so so uh yeah, I'll play I'll play a clip with this like later, I think. But I um, and I actually didn't know that, which is as the resident Glenn Gary Glenn Ross scholar, I had no idea that that was so, I don't so, know that much about how it was made. Cause cause so this came brought, out like when you didn't have like things like yeah. Robodoc. So, so the first thing about it is that they were going to get um, Alec Baldwin to star in it and be the Richard Roma role because Al Pacino was like, oh, I don't know if I want to do it. And then he was going to, and then so he came back and then Alec Baldwin was under contract and they couldn't get him out of the contract. So it was like a bunch of back and forth. He finally decides uh, he can't do it. Then, then fucking David Mamet calls him up and he's like, look, I have this one scene for you. Can you come in for this one scene and like give it your all? And he came in. And the, the thing is that uh, Jack Lemmon was there and obviously like legendary actor, right? Like everybody yeah, knows. Yeah. That he's like mm -hmm. the most legendary actor across all fucking cinema and the stage and everything else. Yeah, um, and he asks, uh, he asks Alec Baldwin, like, really give it to me. He's like, look, just, <laughs> I, I wanna, I wanna feel, you know, I need to feel this because like his his style of acting is so fucking visceral. He's like, I need to feel this. And so he, so Alec Baldwin is going like back and forth. They're riffing, and he like calls him a bunch of shit and like screams at him. And the hatred you see in Jack Lemmon's eyes is like real hatred. He wouldn't talk to him on set. Yeah. Um, before and after mm. that, he was he was trying to really feel himself in that role and and feel that like that visceral hatred of this guy so much that uh that he really just had Alec Baldwin like hit him with that. Alec That's Baldwin what Jared Leto was, thought he was doing, by the way. <laughs> 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 uh, 
but I mean, that's a different kind of method than I, I think. Uh, Doesn't like, he have like a cult to run of underage girls on a private island? Jack Lemon? Jack Lemon? No. <laughs> <Jared Leto. laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, no, I would believe that though. Yeah. Either either uh, one know, is believable. You know, the thing no. I love about this movie is that uh, you could like uh, actually any of the actors can take any of the roles, and it would yeah. be just yeah. as good. Yeah. Yeah. Different, you know, wouldn't be the same, it, you know, because mm -hmm. like uh, any of them could pull off any of those roles, and, and it really feels like they're it'd still be amazing. Each other. They're yeah, it's, right, it's right. One of those plays that yeah. are kind of like simple, where you know, any like they could just like kind of like did what the outsiders, like what Francis Ford Coppola did with the outsiders, where he was like, let's just have a bunch of young kids read each other's lines, and then we'll see who fits what role is mm -hmm. best for them. And it's sure. almost like this. Mm -hmm. I feel like well, they I, 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 like, role. It's and like, like I said, my my uh, my play experience was like it was the same story, but it it hit totally different because like the mm -hmm. actors, like because what are you gonna do? Like you're, you're gonna try to do like an Al Pacino impression? You're gonna try mm -hmm. to do a Jack Lemmon impression? No, that that's dumb. Why would you know? Yeah. Get out of here. Mm -hmm. So, it, yeah, it, but it was like whoa. Clangarily. Well, when people like a cover of a song, they like a cover of a song that's a little different for a reason. Yeah. They don't want to just hear you sing that exact song. Right. Yeah. You 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 should be putting your own into it. I, I think it's well, and I I, I force I know you're trying to introduce this clip of uh, the. No, I, I wasn't. I wasn't. Yeah, I was like. We, we'll get we, there. We'll we, get we, there. Do it later. Well, but I I think I, I don't think anyone here would disagree uh, that the the Alec Baldwin monologue it, it's up there with like the Ned Beatty in Network. It's it's uh, yeah. uh, Judd Hirsch in the Fablemans, where it's like that. It steals the movie, mm -hmm. and 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 this is a movie. Filled with incredible performances. Like, like, everybody, everybody, everybody has a killer monologue. Everybody like it's, it's like if it's, it's like imagine you're doing like a theater class or an acting class, and they're like, just pick a monologue and you pick a monologue from Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and you really sell it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just like pick anywhere. I mean, you're good. <laughs> only if you're a guy though. But well, <laughs> yeah, but that makes sense. Hey, hey, whole... Let me do it. <laughs> I don't know. Plot team of it. At there, all. there was a there was an iteration of the play where it was all women doing. They they. Oh my god! Whoa! Yeah, whoa, 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 whoa. And so down there. Friends. You mean they made a DEI play of Glenn Gary and Glenn Ross? <laughs> they they, they all black lesbians. Everybody in. Glenn but Marie. The original, Glenn. The, the original, Glenn Close. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the original. Um, well, Glenn is like you know it's a name that could go either way. But uh, Joe Montanega, like the you know we talked Joe, about him. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Joe Montana, by yeah, the way, because there was Montana, a Saturday Night yeah, Live yeah. bit about people thinking yeah, that yeah. the kid it's thought only... it was Joe Montana, the football yeah, player. No, no but uh, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, uh, he, he's, he's the original Richard Roma. Mm. I believe it because Mamet uh, loves that dude. Like, and like, uh, he's actually in some of, well, Mamet directed. Um, uh, there's a there's a few other movies that that Mamet actually because he decided he was going to give uh, take a hand f uh, at directing himself. So there's really great stuff like uh, Spanish Prisoner, like Heist is later State of Maine. I know uh, Katie, I know you're a fan of that. I one. fucking love that one. That's uh, how you love the damn. You fucking love it. Yeah, abs yeah absolutely. Uh, but House of Games '87 is is like. That's that's Joe Montana, not Montana, uh, <laughs> and uh, that that one rips that's too. Big, yeah. It's really good, and like mm -hmm. it, it's good in a way that like it's now been sort of mainlined into uh, attempted <laughs> prestige television, so it doesn't seem that like daunting or jarring. Mm -hmm. But at the time, there mm -hmm. wasn't like a lot of things done, like like in the way that Homicide: Life on the Streets, mm -hmm. right, was so groundbreaking. But then mm -hmm. like then like two or three very famous shows basically just. Took took the whole thing and ran with it. Now we only think of those shows, but it was homicide. It was like homicide life on the streets, right? So, well, and, and of course, the camera work on that was groundbreaking. We, yeah. we now we think of the same actors and the same pretty much fucking like showrunner for The Wire because he went on Fat, to, fat like, Tony. That's right. He's in The Simpsons. Joe Montana. I forgot he's Fat Tony. Yeah. <laughs> I totally forgot. Wow, I completely that. forgot. Good good call there. That's good a deep call. Cut. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but th but that's also to me that's like when when Christina posted a meme of uh, uh you know like it was like or that no, was a meme it was like a story about Jennifer Tilly uh, it was bound right it was like yeah, Jennifer Tilly of Chucky. of Chucky fame and I was like oh oh no <laughs> I mean, I mean yeah, that's what she's known for now yeah. with that Chucky show oh, unfortunately nice. like. Uh. It's like, like Trent Reznor from the Social Contract soundtrack or whatever. Yeah, right. yeah. 
Well, also, too, a lot of the Chucky <laughs> soundtrack artist is Trent very Reznor. meta now, you know, like very, very, very meta with her. Uh, no, and I'm sure it's great. It's just you have to understand that, uh, yeah. That's, She's that's, done other things. That's heretical to someone yeah. Andy and I's age, or at least to me anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to the, the, the scripts, what I thought was so interesting, because I had not seen Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross before like two days ago. Yeah. Every that's single amazing. scene was popping with a like, oh, shit, I have. I've seen an actor do this monologue. Sure. Every single scene, I was like, oh, yeah. crap. Oh, wait. Yeah. So impressive how much depth there is and so much you can you can go at for it. Well, it, is, it seems like it really is a perfect, like, uh, acting school kind of uh, play, right? Like, because you can, yeah. any, any part of this movie, right? Like, you can either do it... Um, Scenes with two people where you can do like the 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 mammoth speak as they call it, where it's you know they're they're doing the back and forth uh, with that like expediated tempo or whatever, or you can do one of the longer uh, monologues, and it's pretty amazing that it cuts between you know uh, like I noticed this today, like the scene with um, Ed Harris and uh, and and with Alan Arkin, they're going back and forth in the restaurant, and that's going on at the same time as Richard Roma right. doing the, the the long thing where Jonathan Price doesn't even say it, just as he goes to answer every time. Which Roman just keeps the conversation going, which is what you do. To tell it's like it. intersecting yeah. and like interweaving, and no, and it, it's that. That's one of the reasons why the movie works too, is that it does that yeah. so elo elegantly. Well, it felt like in Les Mis when they have all those actors come in with their their song from before and their song before, and it becomes a right. bigger song all at once, and you're just like, oh shit, ah, something is happening that's larger than just people talking. Yeah, yeah act and, one's about the end. And well, <laughs> it's, pretty, it's also pretty amazing that they almost do the thing where you can um. Like you know, when you're doing a play, right? Like you can like rotate like the the, the set around a lot of times, like they do mm -hmm. that. It, it's interesting that it, the, that Very conversation simple. with uh, Al Pacino and and Jonathan Price is going on literally in the same restaurant because the Chinese restaurant across the street mm -hmm. is where they do business. Also, I do not believe anyone that would just be sitting in that restaurant drinking at the bar has the money to buy all those condos. <laughs> <laughs> in this economy, yeah. well, yeah. that economy. I mean, like maybe right. exactly. a little bit further than across economy. the street. <laughs> well, yeah. So, I, 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 and so the it, it's it's the intersection of everybody, top of their game. That this is like if you're into good writing for movies, this is exceptional. Written. Like Aaron Sorkin could never, but Aaron Sorkin feels like <laughs> this is what he does all the time, and like mm -hmm. it is not what he does all the time. No. <laughs> uh, because as much as, yeah, there is mammoth speak, don't get me wrong, but like this is actually not necessarily mammoth speak. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, it, there is a naturalism to it that I think elevates it beyond uh, some of the other, which I like. I, mm -hmm. I'm i not mad at mammoth speak. I love Spanish Prisoner. Cam that's one of my favorite Campbell Scott movies. It's fantastic. Steve mm -hmm. Martin is in that movie in a dramatic mm -hmm. role. I, I, think, I think the parts of this that are mammoth speak are like the, the scenes between them when it's like the echoing of the, um like yeah. whatever the person says, like that feels very David Mammoth when he's like, mm -hmm. oh, and Alan, Alan Arkin sure. kind of, and, and like, but it also works naturalistically because you realize that guy is kind of like an empty, an empty head, right? Like they're all like yeah. trying to gas the Alan Arkin character up into, you know, like robbing his place for them. And you realize like, this, it's kind of just like a slow old man that really can't, he, he can't yeah, he's, like, he's like a tabula rosa, right? He's, he's there yeah. to be imbued with uh, with, with meaning. <laughs> so, so for him to kind of be slow and be like, oh, you mean, uh, you know, you, you mean you're going to steal the leads? And he's like, well, we're, we're just talking. He's like, and I like that they do the thing of talking and speaking. It's like, we're just yeah. we're just talking right now. Are, are we speaking? And he's like, we're, we're talking, right? Like, yeah. they, there's like a, like a very around the bush kind of thing, which is what you'd want to do if you are... Uh, you know, just some guy working in a place. If you're planning a crime. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, exactly. planning a crime as someone that's probably never, I mean, you imagine Ed Harris, this is, this is his freak yeah. out, right? Like, this is his big yeah. midlife crisis. Like, he has yeah. probably not done a um, a robbery before. I mean, maybe he goes to every job and just steals the leads and gives them to this other guy. Also, why is he not just working for the other guy? Well, maybe maybe mm -hmm. times are tough and there was belt tight, tightening going on. Yeah. Like, or maybe yeah. he's lying about really having that much of an in with True. that guy. Everybody's sure. lying a little. But mm -hmm. what I really loved about the naturalistic dialogue was what I loved about American fiction. It was this, this sort of like yeah. je ne sais quoi about what it is that makes Alan Sorkin feel like, God, this is uh, esprit de l'escalier. Like, this is what you wish you would have said. And Mammoth what? is what you could actually imagine yourself saying because you wind up cursing because you don't have all the right words right? And, and it yeah. still lands great. Like, oh, it's, it's really, really impressive. And I found myself, even though this is entirely a male cast and this is about male, like struggling for what is mensch, I still completely related to this. And I don't know if this was close to your first time seeing it either, Christina, but did you feel like this was still entirely relatable? 
Yeah, I that's I remember no, from knowing the play first. I was like, oh wait, there's a movie adaptation. So I remember seeing it when I was a little bit younger, like in my early teens. And then when I you know watched it again recently, I was like, huh, interesting. I, <laughs> yeah, thought, it, I thought that same way too. Yeah, it does transcend that barrier, even though it could just be like, oh, this this guy is just this. Look at these men just trying to be men, and you're like, no, look at the struggle of kind of trying to be human. Mm -hmm. Well, because, right, because they're sitting there talking about, like, you know, oh, you know, uh, they're deadbeats, like, if they're not, like, buying this property, <laughs> you know, like, like how they choose to, yeah. how they internally yeah. uh, make themselves the heroes of their story, right, where, where mm -hmm. the people that, that are, again, not buying into these pres presumably, like, busted-ass properties and losing their life savings are deadbeats for not doing it. And But the fact that you can see them sort of internally reconciling that and being mad at the situation and sort of, like, trying to find a scapegoat in that same way that, ah, how how wonderful is it when, when Jack Lemmon just rips Kevin Spacey to shreds? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the only thing that hasn't really aged well. So I forgot Kevin Spacey's in this movie. And every time I see <laughs> Kevin Spacey in a movie, I just, I'm like, I want to yeah. forget. But but him getting ripped to goddamn shreds by by uh, Jack Lemmon's kind of astounding. Everybody and Al Pacino yeah. and everyone yes. else. Everyone. Well, he gets, he gets ripped. To, he gets ripped to shreds by everyone because the character. So <laughs> he's just he's, he's like the middle manager, right? Like he's mm -hmm. he's the guy that everybody can rip to shreds because you can't like call up Mission Murray at the you know the, the corporate office and be like, yeah. let me talk to him. And I like that they all bragged that they could reach Mission Murray if. Blah 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 blah. Like you know what I mean? Like they're yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, like I could get Mission Mary on the phone. It's like I just oh, don't want to do you it. Could, you would have. Ah. Right? Like, <laughs> right, <exactly. laughs> well, it's, it's interesting how each one of them lives in the exact moment that they're in. Where like if they're down, they're down. But if they're up, they don't even remember being down. And fuck everybody else who's down. And well, like and that sales. That's very real. Yeah, that's, that's yes, real. yeah. That's relatable. <laughs> I, I worked sales for a while, and I remember um, like uh, people try, try, trying to get me to uh, join them in some scams and selling insurance <laughs> uh, that were scams, and <laughs> yeah, uh, all this kind of weird stuff. And and uh, I'm glad I didn't because that uh, I it just was soul destroying uh, a lot of it. That's why yeah. I'm a I feel like um, I feel like a movie that does but, um, somewhat of like a modern uh, equivalent of this for part of it. I mean, then it gets really crazy. But sorry to bother you. I feel like does a kind of oh sure. Um, yeah. When they're all in the office, and when Fair. when everyone everyone's like, I don't give a fuck about this job when they're not doing well. But as soon as you know, as soon as the Keith Stanfield starts fucking killing it on the phone, yeah. like he's he's doing the dances and he's like, mm -hmm. you know, just jumping around, and it's like, yeah, you know, once you're up, you're up. It's almost like an addictive thing. And, well, and it it shows that exists. same cycle yeah. we were talking about on Wall Street, right? That like it's, it's yeah. like the the common theme of of like how it gets you caught in this cycle of greed. That again, like like you said. The machine, right, is is like you know down on his luck and like you know the, the, being super like kind of salty about it, and then suddenly like you know, top of the world the second the second he quote unquote makes a sale, and and, and the way that his and it's an uh, asshole like the second he is, and, and the way that the way <laughs> that that's asshole. formulated right like the way that his scenes are formulated, it's almost like you're watching an addict. Like, uh, mm -hmm. the way that oh, he begs, sure. he's, like, oh, yes. in the car with him and he's like, he's like, please just, you know, I'll do anything, you know, $50. Sure, sure, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, just give yeah. me the leads. Just give me the leads. And it's like, it's, it's so almost true. like the leads are like some kind of, you know, heroin or like cocaine or something. And you realize mm -hmm. like, this is this guy's almost like whole life. Like his, yeah. his daughter is sick and he needs the money for stuff, but he's Ugh. not like he's ever calling his wife and kids at home or whatever, besides, you know, his daughter that's in the hospital. Like this seems like, like traveling salesman kind of is his life. And so and that's that goes back to like the death of a salesman type thing, right? Where it's like right. uh, a, a faded character like that. Like he feels very. You get really just involved. enough of the backstory, yeah, to be like, yeah. yo, this guy's life is wild, tragic, and like he, this <laughs> thing that is like the center of his world is not going so great as it yeah. turns out. <laughs> Well, you feel like it's true for all of them because as Pacino goes on at the end about like we're a dying breed, like well, this type of sales is not going to continue in this fashion for very much longer. So like your your career is dying, not just you. Well, and yeah, then yeah. and then you know, and maybe that's okay, the, but <laughs> it transforms into the yeah. sorry to bother you style telemarketing where yeah, it, it's yeah. even more soulless. Mm -hmm. be, you know, yeah. sometimes or, you get to go or, to somebody's. Yeah, I mean, you know, let's not forget. Like, I remember uh, one of my friends who uh, I was doing sales with uh, left to do uh, reverse mortgages for people, and oh, yeah, uh, yeah, and, and uh, but like, like you know, he he would tell the story that uh, you know that that he's really trying to get people into homes and trying to get people to save their homes, and really believed that, like, like genuinely. Yeah. You got um, him. Yeah, and, and that's the thing is like you know, yes, these salespeople, you, you see them like uh, we we don't know if they're they're selling the you know 
you know, what they're selling, what the quality is. It's not important. <laughs> but the thing is, is that they believe it. Like this is this the quality is, is they, not good. And this yeah. quality is definitely it, not yeah, good. This, well, I, I, and and again, that goes back to what I was saying. That, like everyone that doesn't buy from them is like a deadbeat and like a, like a jerk, right? And, and but like also, if you, I love that you get to see the machine like out on his sales pitch, and he's got like these smiles these, that like never touch the eyes, right? And like he's, and he's just so like, yeah, and 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 it's 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 awkward and like, it's like compelling and like it's like oh my god what's happening right the guys, now the guy uh the scene is pretty heartbreaking where he's in the guy's house and he's pitching to him and he's like i would like yeah. to give it back to you rebate and he has this whole story he comes up with the whole thing yeah. and then the guy's like so you're here to sell me land he's like yeah oh no 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 no, 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 no like, no, he's like yeah this is every fucking like <laughs> Sales we going too far. He says, I, "I, I think you know." Since we mentioned the Simpsons earlier, he's a very um like old Gil, like where you have. Oh like God, a, oh, Gil is definitely old based Gil, on. Give me one more chance, and like this, he's always like on the verge of fucking yeah. suicide in the Simpsons. Like that's mm -hmm. the that that character reminds me a lot of uh, Jack Lemmon. Well, and there's and there's other speaking of Gills. I mean, like look, Saul Goodman, like some like the fake mm -hmm. secretary thing. Like mm -hmm. I'm not yeah. sure. I don't think I ever saw anything like that before. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, and like it's weird that. As much as this movie is sort of like, you know, for the true heads, it's like ingratiated itself into popular culture in weird ways. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, th I think something with that is, um, I mean, every writer and every actor, right? Like David Mamet is someone huge in, in both of those senses. Yeah. So like a movie like this where actors are at their top, the top of their game and like writers that are trying to write like these interesting kind of intricate like noir stories or whatever. Like both of them, th this is the kind of movie for those true heads. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, absolutely! And it's shot like a noir too, which I loved. That, that was just that, that it's was always raining. <laughs> that that <laughs> the neon. Uh, oh, God, it was so beautiful. So there's so a saxophone. Apparently the uh, apparently the rain machine <laughs> were the were the biggest expense on the film because the first half was obviously shot entirely with rain. So they paid more for the rain machines than any other singular thing throughout this. Because this is obviously like a low budget movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is that's insane. <laughs> Oh, it's, about, it's also it also makes it funny that it's only raining for half of it, right? Like it hits the second half and it stops raining for the rest of it. And well, like, and did you guys just run out of money for those? Yeah, they ran, exactly. They couldn't. They couldn't. Like okay, we're staying inside for the rest. Of it. Every well, they ran out of quarters for the rain machine. <laughs> I actually have a theory on that. I know that we're saying like it feels so much like a play, and it definitely does feel like a play. But when it starts out, the camera is so close, and we're doing yeah. some really close up acting. And as it as we start to lose the rain, which is heavily movie. It starts to pull back, and we start to see how tiny these guys are, and how small and frail. Oh. And the rain stops because it's it's a play again. Then it fully yeah. actualizes into this play setting, and we see these tiny, distant little men. I mean that that's I think that's a hundred percent. Yeah, I think that's a hundred percent accurate because yeah. the rest of it really. I mean, it's not only like a play in the sense that it's in that room. It's like a play in the sense that the entrances and act, like exits are all theatrical and big enough. That yes. when a character leaves or when a character exits, they're exiting stage right or stage left. Like, yeah. It's the kind of, especially fucking Al Pacino, I think that's how he leaves just their entrance rooms anyway. Yeah. But like, it's yeah. true. <laughs> well, but I think also oh, it's a king and then in. he leaves. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, I think the, the, so the biggest complaint about Glenn Gary Glenn Ross is that it's like, oh, it's too play like. And I'm like, well, but is it though? Because, no. No. because think of any movie that is set in like a small, more or less single location. It's oh, always it's a case of being like a play. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, but it really, it's, what it's, does that no, mean? it's a movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What does that mean? No, but, but it means it did have a million, like, trillion budget. What right, I love exactly. about this is even though, it, yes, it, it, you know, like, like it does feel like a play at times, it, it still is like, they do enough of like bringing you in like like those close ups. Right. You cannot do close ups yeah. like that, mm -hmm. and those close ups really draw you into the characters in and a way that the play can't. What do they I expect to film the stage production, or what's it, what are you gonna call that a movie then? <laughs> yeah, where everything's like uh, you know on somebody's shot. iPhone. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and Jack I mean, Lemmon is acting it. with his full face. We're getting close up uh. eyes. We're seeing his eyes well up. You're not gonna get that in a play. And again, and again, that goes back to two, like when he's on the sales call and he's like, he's got those empty smiles and like, you know, sort of like just look at like, and, and it, it's, it really is when I say it's a master class of acting, that's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Do, do you think because he plays Homelander actually watch this and goes like, that's, that's oh. how they play Homelander? Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Good, oh my God. A yeah. It's a good call. But yeah. like, yeah, it, it, it's, I think it's, it's almost like, it's almost when some, oh, it's play like that, that is like meant to reduce it somehow. Right. And then, and, 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 and it's like, well, <laughs> 12 Angry Men is play like as well. It's like people in a room. 
you know? Yeah. But like, look at like that movie and how what they do with the horizon line and like how like things change like as it goes on and, and, and as the deliberations continue. Like that is a different style of movie making. Look, there may not be anything exploding, but it doesn't mean it's like, you know, mm -hmm. like less of a movie because of that. I, I, I will say the, the, one of the things that's funny though is that uh, James Foley, like the director who you know took over the directing part for David Mamet, uh, his first thing was like, "Oh, well, I don't want to just film a play," and it's like you, know, you yeah. can do so much more with it than just that. Like, mm -hmm. it's like I like it's the same thing with the fucking Alec Baldwin thing, where it's like you know if you can't do the leads, I you know I don't I don't feel any pity for you if you can't sell or close the sales. You know what I mean? If you can't if you can't turn this into something outside of a play, like you yeah. know mm -hmm. I don't feel bad for you. It's funny because the audience that wants to say like, oh, this is like a play, that's that's belittling a play. But at the same time, they'll say like a play is too bourgeois. It's like it can't yeah. be both those things. Well, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know how much crossover between the people that you know would use those two phrases is. But the, the one but thing I would say then. about this, uh, the one thing I would say about this as uh, it being like a play is that, that there is a lot more of explaining things from the characters and where a film yeah. typically would like pull back on that a bit and just like I let you kind of sit with it. But the thing is though, it's like it's the actors are doing so much. Like you don't need that, uh, that those, because you get those moments of them, you know, with those close ups. Yeah. Um, so, and, so and like, plus, yeah, I think their arguments mute. <laughs> yeah. Plus two with the play, with the stage, you have to be very dramatic, very loud, very, yeah. you know, Old body hands. Project. But, yeah. with, yes. but with a film, you have to strip it down. That's why those close ups come in handy because, you know, it's more, it, the act is more intimate. It's not as, you know, out there and dramatic and like, you know, where people be like, what the hell? I mean, first of all, we're getting close ups, but second of all, they're yelling at us. <laughs> I, I do imagine, though, this is like, this is what Barton Fink thinks he's writing. <laughs> he's like, he's like, that the is common so man. Good. He can't so tell. He can't tell real estate in Florida anymore. The common man. <laughs> I need that Glenn Gary Glenn Ross feeling. <laughs> can, you, can you imagine trying to be the camera doing the close up on Pacino and being like, "You have here. Okay. You have here. Please, you have to stay still. This <laughs> is as much." Yeah. He, he, just, he keeps moving and he's like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> but I think like all the stuff like like in the Chinese in, in the Chinese restaurant and stuff, like all the, the stuff where he's like, you can tell like why he's a good salesman because like the character is very suave and the kind of mm -hmm. just like is very unhurried about it. How he gets there. He's like telling these like weird little like like memorable anecdotes and like phrases that, you know, uh, are like, oh, that's interesting. I never thought about that. And like you get a really good sense of the character there. And and I do think it is like, I love Al Pacino, but he definitely got stuck in a thing for a while. And, I, and I've seen him in a bunch of stuff where he hasn't been doing that because I think people goofed on him enough that like maybe he got self-conscious about it, but mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe not. Care, so he Loud up animated the characters. And just did that. He was like. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, it's, but it's interesting to me that I, I do think it's like for a long swath of time, he just was like, I'm just going to show up and do the Al Pacino thing, punch this clock and get, get that check, you know? I mean, part <laughs> of it, part of it is also, I think that he's like a stage actor, which everybody forgets about. They think about Dog Day after Afternoon. Yeah. Right. Like, I mean, and that, that's another perfect example of, of like, it's like, that might be like my favorite performances ever, but it's like not even you know it's a very different kind of performance but he got so good at being like people thought of him as like oh you're so good at playing this type of dude that it was it was notable that like when he did other things and it becomes self-fulfilling if you don't give that performance the audience gets mad because that's what they're there to you're see. not doing the thing do the thing yeah. we like i i i feel like though like the, the fact that he's a play actor right? like he's a stage actor like he, he's doing <laughs> yeah. that constantly in between all these movies and i feel like as he did that even more he kind of well number well he also had like an oxycontin addiction or whatever but like as he did that even more uh and he like went you know and he went and he did it big and like did these big theatrical performances i feel like he more and more thought of, of uh movies as just like a way to pay the bills sorry i'm so of, distracted yeah. my, good my, point, my good point. max is here you sweet boy oh <laughs> by the way loves the director James Foley, uh, do you know what his two most recent movies have been? Or Fifty Shades Darker and Fifty Shades Freed. I was I'm uh, not even kidding. 
I, I was I was looking at something that was like, oh, they brought him aboard for the second one. <laughs> they yeah. didn't even give him Fifty Shades of Grey. They gave him the second no, no, one. they gave him the second and the third one. <laughs> really? I just listened to the how did this get made about those movies? There's something else, man. <laughs> yeah, he also did Who's That Girl with Madonna, but that was before this. Yeah, yeah he should have brought a lot of stuff with Madonna. Madonna. Jesus they Christ. should have brought Al Pacino into Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> you get some music videos for her as well, too, right? Al Pacino? No, no. Right. <laughs> oh, James Foley. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I would definitely me. watch that that video, though. Well, look, <laughs> Romancing the Stone, that, that, that like, freaking the whole cast was in that the, the one video. Like a, <laughs> like like a virgin. Yes. Like a virgin. Ocean. Touched for the very first time. Exactly. 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 Well. Mm. <laughs> I, I love, though, I love... It's almost like a... Almost like a the dog's all worked up now. Oh. Uh, yeah, I was too, let me, I'll fix that. <laughs> There's almost like a full fledged seduction to the scenes that he does with uh, Jonathan Price. Yeah, like yes. the way that he yeah. goes around it, and he gets a little weird there for a second when he's like, "You like, you like fucking young girls? What? Who? Yeah, who am it. I to judge?" Like, like, nobody right, said anything about that. Dude. I know he's very, very unjudging. He just went throw that out there. He does feel like a character that has an incredibly high charisma modifier, and Jonathan Price feels like a character who is like, don't just no good stats. Yeah, like it's yeah. pretty easy. Well, Jonathan Price also engages him at the bar at one point. He's like, he like makes some comment, and you can see Al Pacino zero in on him in the very beginning. Yeah, and then mm-hmm. he spends the rest of the thing trying to make the sale. Well, I think it's so cool because you see his sales style and contrast that with the machine, right? Who's who's like coming at it from like the old school, like Fuller Brushman, like you know, get literally get the foot in the door, you know, any way yeah. possible. Well, you, have, you have to go around and you know be a little seductive and do some foreplay. You can't just yeah. go in there jackhammering like the machine. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's, being, he's, being too, he's going into to whatever people people know yeah. that it's a sale. You know, with Al Pacino's style, he's kind of just foreplay. You don't know it's a sale. You think he's just like a guy being nice, and then he and then the way that he uh, he doesn't even you know he's not even like you should buy these he's like maybe this means something to you maybe it doesn't and if it doesn't he'll he'll back off i mean he won't but you know he'll, he'll pretend that he's going to back off there is a weird like kind of seduction to out yeah to, to the ricky mm-hmm. Roman characters uh sales tactic well one of the first things he says is uh he's like you're queer who is it you know what i mean like, <laughs> right. like, <laughs> which again another quotable monologue i'm like oh my god i've definitely heard someone say this yeah no it, it's 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 really kind of stunning and it's it's again usually situations like this they'll be like oh these two people got these incredible monologues or these these two great performances everybody gets a little freaking moment you know and it heats up like yeah the first monologue's at minute nine right (laughs) and everybody's monologue doesn't start it like immediately the first line they say your attention is grabbed and then they hold you for the whole thing it's that's it's, rare genuinely impressive and that's one of the reasons mm-hmm. i'm really glad that you came on to talk about this because as someone who is an actress right? yeah like, that's I, was, I was that... thinking about that while i was watching i was like kt is gonna have a lot to say about this like just as someone that acts like as that was a... no accident let's put it that way like, <laughs> and as someone who writes as well like it's always fascinating to me how to make dialogue that fits your story is compelling is believable and then mammoth throws a second level on it in this where they have the the soundtrack behind it propelling it forward and and existing right. in the same place behind it's really transcendent it, so, it, there, it, so this it, is it uh works. speaking of speaking of the monologue at minute nine which isn't in the play they wrote it obviously specifically for alec baldwin there's alec baldwin talking about shooting it that watch costs more than your car i made nine hundred seventy thousand dollars last year how much you made you see, pal, that's who I am, and you're nothing. Nice guy? I don't give a shit. Good father? <laughs> Fuck you. Go home and play with your kids. <laughs> my agent at the time, Michael Bloom, who's since passed away, he was my dear friend. He was my agent for 11 years. He was very smart, and he said that Pacino had been in and out of the role of Ricky Roma a few times. Pacino was always got uh, kind of a buyer's remorse sometimes in terms of film. I don't know how true that is, but he went to the producers of the film and said, if if Al balks again and doesn't do the film, would you let Alec play Ricky Roma? And they were like, yeah, that's that's an interesting idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. And what we were led to believe was he did walk away again. 
And they did offer me the part of Ricky Roma. And then, you know, all hell broke loose. And then all of a sudden, everybody gets, you know, realigned and we're back in place. And Al's going to play Ricky Roma. And they said to me, would you play Blake? And I, and I get Mammon on the phone. And I said to Mammon, uh, you know, what I find interesting is that you won the Pulitzer Prize for the play. Uh, why did you feel the need to rewrite the Pulitzer Prize prize winning play? <laughs> and he said, you know, Mehmet talks like this. He's very kind of... Uh... He said, these men are going to commit a crime and they're not criminals. They don't have a criminal nature and I need to put the vice on them and really kind of squeeze them a little hard to become criminals. Because you are the DS, DS ex machina to come in and put that pressure on them to do something. He said, I always felt that was a flaw in the story. I thought, well, you fooled the Pulitzer people, but uh, he, um, he said, I always thought that was a flaw in the story that we needed. So he writes this monologue. And I come in and I rehearse that summer, I believe. Mm -hmm. And it was hard to lay into those guys. Here I am with all these people. I mean, Ed and Kevin and Pacino wasn't in the scene. And uh, uh, Jonathan Price wasn't in the scene. But Lemon, mm -hmm. who I had worshipped, I worshipped him. And there he is. I'm being presumptuous here, but Lemon did a thing with me where he like kind of encouraged me to stay where I was with him. Don't warm me up. Don't talk to me. Don't let's all stay in this ugly place. A-I-D-A. -A. Get out there. You got the prospects coming in. You think they came in to get out of the rain? A guy don't walk on the lot lest he wants to buy sitting out there waiting to give you their money. Are you going to take it? Are you man enough to take it? And when we were done, he was very kind to me and said, uh, you know, he, he paid me uh, you know, a really nice compliment when we left. And it was tough, you know, it was the rehearsal. I didn't know the lines, so I improvised. I think I th said things in the rehearsal that were 10 times worse oh, than what we, I was like, you know, you know, I said, I think I said to Lemon one day, I go, you know, blah, 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 your balls. Remember when you had a pair of balls, old man? I would say like these really reductive things. And then Lemon was like, you yeah, fuck, just stared at me, you know. And I just marvel at uh, uh, what a great job Foley did, Jamie Foley and, um, and Juan Ruiz and Chia was the DP, one of those great monastic DPs who hardly spoke to you. They did a great job. It's really, I think it's a great movie. Man, yeah, that's... So first of all, <laughs> that scene is not meant to be, here's a cool guy doing cool guy stuff, just to be clear. No, cool guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's such a cool watch, though. Yeah. <laughs> and I was stunned, flabbergasted, and disgusted when... You know, for a time period, I, I worked, you know, I was in technology, but in finance, and that a lot of bros, all bros, love this movie, but only that speech and only as like an inspirational pump up. I'm like, no, you, no, no, you are completely missing the point here. Like, this is not, that's not the point of any of this. I mean, I can't mm -hmm. tell you how many sales meetings I've been to where they actually reference this and it's right. ridiculous. Mm hmm. But th yeah. that said, that like the elegance of the vulgarity of the language, like the what's my name? Fuck you. That's my name. Like, mm -hmm. and Ed Harris actually chuckles because like it's like holy shit, dude. I love Ed Harris. <laughs> but that's the realistic nature. Like you, you don't. You're not super eloquent. One of the lines right. has to be clunky, like fuck you, and and and. You know, it's really interesting. Uh, Abby points out in the chats that Alec Baldwin's character here does kind of wind up being what we see on 40 Rock. And and I wonder if that's why Tina's Fake's character is called Lemon. Called yeah. Lemon. Oh, yes. wow. Yes. I love, I love that. Like, that. Like, the first thing I thought of hearing him say Lemon is, Lemon, it's Wednesday. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. exactly. I, I remember looking into it. I think that's right wow, why they did that. that. Wow. I love, I love 30 Rock, too. Never watched what it. What a deep cut. It's oh, a great it's a show. great show. Great it's show. really good. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's the show that everyone realized John Hamm is funny. <laughs> no, I, but his best friend. Amongst many other things. He was Will Forte and Rachel Dratch and him all hung out together. So, yes, he's incredibly funny. He just also is, like, super attractive, which is unfair. But Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, how hard for him. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> but but no, like like the, like like the way that 
that monologue that Alec Baldwin does moves and changes and how he moves across the room, like stalking them, <laughs> you know, like it, it's a real predator prey relationship. Donald Trump tries to do like, like literally like, like you remember the 2016, yeah. um, uh, debate with Hillary Clinton. He basically like tries to pull Alec Baldwin and like dominate the, the stage in a very similar manner. Yeah. And um, then he played except- him on SNL for like four years. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's why. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah. Because exactly. I, I think there's a a weird, um, you know, uh, inception of like Ouroboros uh, eating each other's tail of <laughs> Trump and Baldwin uh, in just real life, right. and, and uh, oh, it's something we probably have to uh, come to terms with. Well, and I think that also it's it's notable too. Like when we're doing promo for this show, so how many people like comment just with you know, coffee is for closers only, right? Everybody knows that line. You know they don't know yeah. where it's from. It's been I knew that referenced before yeah. I saw the movie, and I said to you, I think isn't it the Hudsucker Proxy? Yeah. And the only thing I knew was coffee was for closers. <laughs> I, but what people don't remember is 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 the put the coffee down, which and yeah. it's that long shot, and Alec Baldwin's on one side, and Jack Lemmon's on this side, just getting the coffee, and he's like, what? What? What are you talking about? Like, and and that that type of workplace hostile environment right <laughs> that type of workplace really hadn't been depicted in that way yeah, things like nine to five right like, okay there's the asshole boss etc cetera, etc cetera. Yeah. but that specific type of of domination and abuse in, in a workplace hadn't really been put on the screen in that way well before. and and i also feel like uh like the late 80s early 90s um like till today really has been like the era of like the motivational speaker like, like, I mean, sure. you, you see it also at the end of like Wolf of Wall Street, right? Like, but the, the motivational speaker is hired Coming by soon. people. Yeah, <laughs> people, people make that as exactly. like a, you got it, Tom. That's 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 how it all begins. <laughs> yeah, well, people make that as a um, <laughs> as like a career. Like they go around from place to place. They're like, oh, I did this successful thing. Here, I'm going to try to motivate you to do that. And I feel like starting in like the late '80s with, with like drug counselors and with this kind of person, right? Like. Those are the two things where you either have somebody coming around going, I did drugs and look at me now, like the fucking, you know, Matt yeah. Foley from fucking the SNL uh, bit. <laughs> or you have this kind of guy that goes around and he's like, I'm super successful and you can be too. And we're still living in that era. Like we're still very much living in that kind of scared straight kind of era. Mm-hmm. I mean, Down by a river van type of like, Yeah, like th- yeah. this version of it is like you're going to get fired if you don't shave up. But then there's also, yeah. you know, like the... <laughs> Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. I mean, that's that's absolutely it. And and like, <laughs> dudes can't stop quoting in the chat, by the way. But yeah, that's like, yeah. it's <laughs> absolutely like, I mean, th- this is uh-huh. like, it, this is absolutely a dudes rock movie for sure. But again, mm-hmm. depending on how you engage with it, because again, there's people that see this like this, again, cool guy doing cool guy stuff. And there's like, whoa, this is horrific. Like, what situation would you be put in? Like, when, wouldn't it be time to like walk away if this was a situation that you were in? Like, what, you know, if you could, like, wouldn't yeah, that be a good ma- idea? Be like, step, you know, be like, kind of step feedback and then just run out. It's well, interesting. And then, yeah. I was gonna say Jack Lemon's got this whole like I need this for my family thing, and you're like you have no marketable skills to have pivoted out of this desperate industry for your family, and we're supposed to feel bad for you though. Yeah, I I, I also I, I feel like it's an um, industry that shouldn't exist. Yeah. Well, the first the first question that you obviously would want to ask a guy that's in the like Alec Baldwin position is like who are like why should we like why should we care what you think about this? And I, and I like that like very rarely does that get asked in something like this, right? Like a lot of people just allow themselves to get plowed over by the motivational speaker or whatever. And and I like that in this, he doesn't answer either. He's very evasive about it. He's like, well, my car costs this much. You never see his car. You don't know for a fact that he's actually yeah. going to go back to that kind of car. He could be going back to the shittiest car you know. You'd never see his fucking car. You know Because I mean? he's, he's a salesman. Day, and that was yeah. a projection. Because they this all whole, lie. Whole, uh, they all lie and the whole point is that that he's like the master salesman and, and like you know what what's i mean i got it for as many times i've seen this i should freaking know the know the lines but like you know i you know i've been sitting here from downtown by mitch and murray and and he's basically telling them that like he doesn't think it's worthwhile right like that and that's that's the motivational aspect of it like what you're talking about forrest and you know yeah yeah what is it? you drove a honda to get here i drove an eighty thousand red eight thousand dollar red bmw it's parked outside i don't know is it who doesn't matter yeah, you so never see that guy go out. Like, you know what I mean? Like, they're they're not going out right after the guy. Like, you're yeah. not gonna see his. Uh... <laughs> is he like negging them then? Yeah. Yeah. Well, because I mean, Moss I mean, asks him, yeah, like, right. "How come you're wasting time with us then? If you're such like such, such a big shot?" And then he immediately points to his watch and starts doing the watch <laughs> thing, which is like, I put the watch <laughs> up my ass. 
But <laughs> <laughs> it's a different watch thing. Like, yeah, but it, but it, but the, but then it, that's the next thing he moves to is this watch costs more than your car, right? Mm-hmm. And then he talks. That's, about that's, a, that's such a bullshit thing to say. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, I know, it's that's such a perfect like pointing to your watch, being like, oh well, this is an expensive watch because you know you're gonna get asked the question. You're standing yeah. up there, why should we listen to you? Of course, the guy has like a nice watch, and be like, oh, this is an expensive watch. It doesn't answer the question, but you're like, oh well, these are the signifiers of things that we assume this person you know is doing well. <laughs> He just he's being sent around by Mitch and Murray like a salesman like anybody else to sell mm-hmm. a product. In that he, case, the product is to sell to you know to, to sell, to sell sales. Sell, yeah. Sell, sell, <laughs> seashells sea, Yeah. <laughs> I was having seashells, a hard time formulating how to say that too. But. wow, that's really he sells <laughs> seashells by the seashore. Sales she sales sells, guys by the seashore. <laughs> she sells more sales yeah. by the seashore. <laughs> well, and then like yeah, so it gets into the whole <laughs> Yeah, it gets into the nice guy. Don't give a shit. Good father. Fuck you. Like just like <laughs> real, just like disassembling really these guys. It's a really sad thing to say when you think about it too. He's like, of course. Yeah. Like if you want to be a good father, go home and take care of your kids. It's like you'd be better suited doing that than than this. This is a sad thing that like should barely exist anymore. You're going from house to house. Nobody wants to talk hear from the salesman besides, I guess, Indians and uh, you know, and the occasional oh. people that call up salesmen because they don't have anyone else to talk there's, to. There's lonely. <laughs> But the thing for, for me, the thing that for anyone that has an ounce of critical thinking skills that shows it as satire is when he walks from behind the podium and he's got the balls. Yeah. <laughs> and again, framing, yeah. Yeah. Some some people are like, oh, that what a cool guy thing to do. And it's like, no, are you kidding me? Like this is this it's is the truck like, nuts of a scene. I, I feel like I feel like there is something that's true about the fact that like it does take balls to sell real estate, just not where they're selling it. You know what I mean? Like, right, right. They're selling right. it in like a beat down office across the street from a, a Chinese restaurant. And they have to use the phone at the Chinese restaurant a lot of the time. Like that is not the place that the, you know. It's like it's like cutthroat to a. Uh, um... No, with the lighting like that, I'd use that phone. That lighting is awesome. I don't, I don't think it's because of the phone that they're using. <laughs> but also, like, if you have a quality product, you don't have to fight this hard to sell it. Yeah. So yeah. we have to assume that these properties that they're selling are crap. Well, and they know it. They, that's what he's talking about. Oh, they're yeah, Rio Rancho. That's it's why a dog. They're you know? Yeah. <laughs> they're like, this and, stuff sucks. Yeah. And they and have like, to like hold each other's contracts in such a way. Like Jonathan Price has right. to be fucked out of his money. Yeah. Well, yeah, they're also absolutely. in presumably. I mean, the original uh, play there in Chicago, but in this, they're presumably in New York City. You're buying real estate <laughs> elsewhere in yep. New York City, right? Like they're calling you to ask, "Hey, do you want to buy this property?" They're not selling you property in New York City. They're selling you property in Florida. Florida. Or yeah. Mm. Which, there is a long there's a long history of these um these weird uh real i think it might i think they're in chicago aren't they or is, is it new york I, I, it doesn't it doesn't matter it, it could be gotham anywhere city. usa yeah, yeah. yeah it's it's like like matter. Chicago. To play there in chicago because because remember because that heiress is talking about or is it alan arkin like they're oh i'm gonna go to wisconsin and well they're they're, they're they shot yeah. a lot of it in like someone uh, talks Island about it something. does not matter the even a little bit cubs game yeah 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 well and that's because there's these Big David Mamet's a big Chicago guy. And that's, yeah, that's even Chicago. In the, even in like the 1920s, right? Like even in the 1930s, like there's these things where people will sell you lots of land in Florida specifically, yeah. which is what they're <laughs> doing. They'll call you like, you know, oh, well, we got this great deal on something. And then the Florida real estate market has crashed several times because they sell too many of the lots. So this is this is like that kind of property that they're selling off. Right. No, no, absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, it's it's to say it's a dog is an understatement, right? Yeah. Same gold nation. Let's go. I think it's condos too. Like they're selling, you know, like uh, I, mean, I guess today the the version of it is like a timeshare. Like they'd essentially be selling something like that, where it's like oh, okay, it's yeah. That, it's I get nobody... so many like commercials, like here's how I can get you out of a timeshare, and I'm like, I don't have one. Like my sister was considering <laughs> buying one, and, and everyone was like, why would you do that? The industry of getting out of the timeshares is just as bad as timeshares themselves. Yeah. John Oliver did a great episode on. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, episode. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and that's and I'm glad someone finally did. I, mm-hmm. yeah, wait, I, the other thing I wanted to say um, about this is there's an entire business that really is selling the names to businesses, which right. um, when when you had you know the original like conservative movement with um, you know all, all, like the Reagan the Reagan campaign and the Goldwater campaign, a big part of the things that they brought to the Thing was that just like in marketing or something, they would sell the the roll the, the rolodex of these names, so right? Sign the things. So that's basically what they're doing with this, but you know, with the original version of that. It, it wasn't. It mm-hmm. actually was not legal before. You're. I'm so glad you mentioned that because that's one of the reasons why it warrants inclusion mm-hmm. into this month because that's part of like 
<laughs> you know the evolution like of, yeah. of basically putting the, the american public up on the buffet table for uh wow. for the for the ravenous uh, predators you know yeah, yeah, I, wanna, yeah. I, wanna, I, wanna, I try to think of uh the name of that kind of marketing but like there's a whole uh, uh, direct uh yeah, direct yeah, marketing direct. but there there's yeah. another word i know what you're talking about it doesn't matter like the, the yeah. point of fact is that like it's the natural extension for what we talked about with wall street too mm. yeah and I remember actually getting on one of the lists for uh, we're getting hard sell calls from uh, uh, Spectrum uh, the, direct the mail, um, yeah. the the Spectrum books where, where like you have to pay money to get your artwork in it. And uh, yeah, you know what people do buy those books. And I and if you go into like a consignment bookstore and you find some, buy them because they're beautiful. That you know, but like like there is a whole like hard sales uh, department. It's like a pay to play kind of situation. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. And, and it, it basically, it does get you in like uh, books that people do look at, but like it costs a lot of money. And if you're not bringing in anything from your art, you know, it's, it's like, you know, that that's like an entire paycheck from, from mm. your sales job. Mm. So, and and the, like other the, thing, the other thing about scams. Uh, stuff like this kind of marketing, right? Yeah, like right. you have to assume, if, that, well, that was the next evolution was a multi. Yeah. Multi. Yeah. yeah. But all like, my friends like, from high school. Oh my God. <laughs> but, but you have to think about it. Like if you have the, the marketing, everybody, like if you have a, a piece of property, everyone's, you know, contacting you about the property, you're not contacting them, right? Like you're not, mm -hmm. yeah, you don't thing. need to, I have yeah. a great mm -hmm. property for you. Like, so the second you hear that, you know, that it's already bullshit. Uh, well, yeah. absolutely. And, and I think that it's so, so before, well, and that's what, that's what we're talking about. Why? Cause it's people, I, a couple people were like, Oh my Glenn Gary Glenn Ross. First of all, it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> Thirdly. Yeah. Thirdly, it completely fits in because if you look at like how the, again, the American public is both incentivized by greed and also made to be the, the product and made to be the, the feast. It, it, like this is like the next stage of it uh, of what happened mm -hmm. and even though it's not explicitly the stock market it's exactly the same sales principles and exactly the same mindsets and methodologies that you see <laughs> throughout the rest of, of media and and you see as like again this was like a, a harsh satire at the mm -hmm. time like a deeply sardonic satire that became reality again yes. just like with wall street <laughs> yes yeah. and, and wall street has the deep themes of like this is how men should behave that right. you should exalt this type of behavior D tied he, into he really that wants that watch and the car he says he has that you never and men seen. wonder why women are supportive of the 4b movement <laughs> Yeah, well, it's like it's cool guys doing cool guy stuff, right? So yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Well, that's what. So I'm interested, and I, I love Katie that you had not seen this before, uh, mm -hmm. because I, I am actually very interested, uh, Christina and Katie, both of you, to to hear not just your take on the movie, but like, <clears throat> again, I. I I always felt that the Alec Baldwin speech got over again. How can you see the literal like brass balls and not be like, all right, <laughs> like, but, but like, does that, did that get over for you? Cause again, this is a different time now. Like we have people that, you know, literally have truck nuts on their, their dumbass trucks. <laughs> yeah. Right. So as Abby points out, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> actually, um, I drove behind one of those trucks and I was like, I was like in 10th grade for my friend's 16th birthday. We all went to see Alice in Wonderland. I was like, I was looking at the truck that was in front of us. And I was like, wait, are those like, is that like a <laughs> those scrotum? Balls? Is that a false yeah, What the hell? Why is that? You're like, you, you drove a, you drove a rusty pickup truck to get here. I drove ford f-150 with <laughs> truck nuts <laughs> yeah you, you still want to mouth off pal and it's like <laughs> i'm still but, being late and to answer your question conan it's still so like there were definitely bits that didn't age particularly well oh, although God. because it's representing a mindset that is so antiquated right. i i'm like yeah well you know you probably shouldn't use the f word like that so many times in a movie but i've definitely worked with a guy who would say exactly that yesterday yeah. right. so <laughs> right. like it's it, it never i think if we were not living in the idiocracy death of like, late stage capitalism that we are in right now it would maybe not be so incredibly relatable but it is and i didn't find it as like yes it's cool guys saying cool shit and it's like the joker and people are gonna make, mistake this but i mm -hmm. i found it to be a deep farce of a person i have met and so that felt really human 
Right, because you don't see that. There that was much. no part of me that felt like this is like, like even Alec Baldwin's kind of just sad. Like uh, th- these are my brass balls, and this is my watch character. Like I, mm-hmm. I don't look like you're like by saying that's a cool guy doing cool guy stuff. You're buying into like a, a thing that he's selling to people, right? Like in yeah. my in my mind, my thought that's is this guy, this guy is bullshit. Like this guy's trying to motivate them to do sales. You never. He's think the best him, salesman of the bunch of them, right? You never, <laughs> you, you never, you never, like never in my life have I, have I seen a motivational speaker in any situation and thought. Yeah, I think this guy really is as great as he says he is to sell the product. If he needed, if he was, he wouldn't be a motivational speaker. Like that's mm-hmm. something you do after you've done like prison time. <laughs> you know, you have like a reputation. Speaking uh, like, of a, next week's movie. Yeah, like oh yeah. <laughs> at the end of it, he really is going around trying to you know sell selling to people, right? Like uh, like that's that's mm-hmm. the kind of Jordan Belford thing. Like that's you don't look yeah. at someone who's at the top of their game and think that this is the same thing with uh and you know no disrespect to David Mamet who actually did one of these it's the same thing with like a master class like I don't look at the like the celebrities that do a master class and think this celebrity has a lot going on right now yeah I mean it'd be nice to watch like Scorsese talk about directing you yeah. know I mean like like no, there's a difference between like the Neil Gaiman master class where he actually gives mm-hmm. like really good advice about writing versus the Hillary oh, yeah. Clinton one which is sure, just I'm, I'm, I'm just saying I'm just oh, saying you like could win an election from one on one by Hillary you, usually Rodham when Clinton. someone gives a master class they're they've stepped back from like the main part of their career and they're at the point where it's like well you know like I like I'm more of like a, a professor emeritus or whatever mm-hmm. now than someone who's necessarily at the top of their game like I don't, the first thing that I think when like a lot of celebrities do master classes is not like oh this is somebody that I think is getting tons and tons of work right now because they, they yeah. I mean, because they get paid a lot of money to do it. Well, but also, I mean, you got to understand too. It's also a different time. Like it was different times. No, but it actually li- literally was a different time that yeah. that this movie was made, <clears throat> and also that it's depicting. Because it's depicting a time that was like even a little bit before. Exactly. This. Yeah. Like but right for- before the world went, you know, <laughs> to to like telemarketing, and like right before it went to uh, eventually. <laughs> Saudi princes and uh, but that's the, but that's sorry, the Nigerian princes. But that's the robotic yeah. that he's talking about at the end, where he's like, "We're the last, we're the last of a dying breed." Yeah. Everyone else right. is so robotic. That robotic oh, is. Well, I mean, it's gotten yeah. to be a hundred percent robotic in some cases. So I feel yeah. like a lot of times you're asking for mm-hmm. advice from a company and they're telling you in something in AI form, like yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, all those it. those text messages and stuff. It's like that's definitely AI. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. like like you know, one time someone called definitely sounded you know they're from India or whatever, and you know, and they were Ooh. talking about how like. My grandmother owed so much money in Social Security, and my mom's like, "Don't be giving her them information. If Social Security, or whatever, or the IRS, they send mail, but even then, fake mail scams have been happening." And I'm like, "Can't trust no one." Right. Well, yeah, so that, that's I don't, I don't mail thing. Yeah. call hey. mail. I, I'm not going to answer because I just, you know, but there's it, but it's, scams but going around. Like, but but then you look at somebody like this, right? And you realize like you could never trust them in the in the first place. Like, mm-hmm. it, like someone, whether something's AI trying to sell you something or a person, it's like they're still trying to sell you. <clears throat> It just got yeah. body right now to the point where you can be like, I can, I know that I could just hang out. Like I feel like in the past people had like yeah. a level of there was like a level of trust in the person on the phone maybe that they're like mm-hmm. you know oh I signed my name to something they're not necessarily going to scam me. I mean mm-hmm. some people still have that trust I guess but like I feel like that's eroded completely in the like the virtual age. But yeah. again that goes back to yeah. like the pre just real real quick the, the 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 Wall Street and Wolf of Wall Street thing like before the pre uh, pre and post Black Friday of just like it's a confidence game it's a confidence yeah. game mm-hmm. the other side of the phone mm-hmm. right. Um, I, uh... Real quick, from, from Sherry from the chat, thoughts on Spacey in this. Whoo, boy. Now, KT, on your show, which is great. Uh, Thank you. Which is, what if, I, what if I don't like it? This came up in a recent episode. You did The Usual Suspects. Yes, which is two years after this particular film came out. And it's mm. it's a really interesting thought about can you dissect the, the man from the art? And a lot of people will say, like, well, was this art created at the time of the crimes? And, yes, we are talking about, like, concurrent stuff Mm -hmm. you have to be upset about what he was doing at the time he was making this art but also dear lord kevin spacey is an incredibly compelling actor and he technically has been found not guilty on all charges there are just good at playing sleazy guys like that also also most of his uh most of the people charging him have died in mysterious circumstances yeah i i don't really like i i it doesn't like interest me to talk about like uh you know, like like when it, when it comes to judging someone's performance based on like I can very easily separate the art from the artist in mm-hmm. in the sense that I think that if I'm asked to buy somebody as like a good person and they're not necessarily a good person, maybe that's harder to buy. But like someone like Kevin Spacey, when it's like he's a creep in this, 
He's, he's, like, he's like a bad person in a creep. Like, in the, it's like my stuff. views on Roman Polanski. <laughs> like, I watched Polanski films up until what he did to that girl. You know, like, I mm-hmm. I, I love Rosemary's mm-hmm. Baby. Like, that's how mm-hmm. I feel. Like, you know, that's that's my, because mm-hmm. I just, you know, there's certain films where you just you just love them too much. But it's mm-hmm. like, like even like with Woody Allen, I'm like, well, now Woody Allen was always a creep to me. I'm like, no, Woody. I don't really, so, I mean, Annie Hall was fine, but whatever. <laughs> Look, I, I, to say they say that I, you know don't like Manhattan that I, I, don't, I don't like any that'd be disingenuous but I don't have to like crow about it you know what I mean yeah, but yeah. Kevin Spacey the thing with Kevin Spacey in this film this was the film that brought him to people's attention because mm-hmm. he he was never uh, he was like yeah, that guy character actor and a bunch of mm-hmm. stuff but it was mm-hmm. it was and he has a minor part in the ref which was a very forgettable Dennis Leary movie and then swimming with sharks was was like the kind of the first attempt for him to do like mm-hmm. uh, which was very good to do like a leading role and that didn't really do that much but then 95 was usual suspects and then there you go yeah, I, think, yeah. I think this movie is why he's at Sundance when the director Brian Singer is with his first mm-hmm. film and he says That's to right. him whatever you do next I will be in it Right, and he is the, the director that yeah, no, another one, one. yeah. All those X Men movies kind of directed by nobody. Yeah, well, what, what I think is actually about kind of that's one bad fucking hat. I think about Kevin Spacey though is because he's so good at roles like this. He's always yeah. creeped me out. Like he's there's always been something mm-hmm. that feels like. Mm-hmm. Oh, I was cre- cre- creeped out by him. I just even like I remember remember the Oscars when Ellen took the selfie with everyone. There's Kevin Spacey background like like this. And I'm like, yes. Oh, well, he. Well, that's I'm like okay. He's judging a face on a, a picture. Oh, he he I just, has I just movie like coming out. Very good at it. Yeah. Yes, he does. This, this month that was filmed and finished in 2001, and and is oh, waiting right. for us to see if we can handle him. So you know, to mm. see if we want to yeah. see him act again because he's a tangibly good actor. And the question you is, wanna, do you want to see me act again? Do you uh, and Louis C.K. is a great comedian too. So yeah. like, and he's out there and just doing it and like with no consequence yeah. now. All right. Yeah. Well, well, I, I feel like I feel you can talk about more. him in the Maybe past without exalting. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things about this role too is the uh, amount of homophobia thrown at his character. I at know a time, oh, at a yeah. time when you know uh, Kevin Spacey was in the closet, and a yeah. lot of times gay actors tended to. Um, uh, get away, from, you know, try to stay away from roles like that where they they play play right. gay or get accused of being gay or having mm-hmm. gay, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah, gay he, he, thrown at him. It's such a great role, role though. Too. It's such it a is. great role. And, and it's and a, he's such a great, like, same thing uh, with Usual Suspects. That role yeah. is very unmenchy. It's the least yeah. menchy in the whole thing. He even uh, he he confronts uh, Jack Lemmon in the closet. You know what I mean? Like that's, for that, <laughs> that that's that. true. That's uh, oh wow! I wa- I walked by Louis C.K. yesterday and wanted to yell "creep" at him. I'm in New York City, by the way. He looks fucked up. Yeah, I've, I've seen him. I've seen like uh, like podcasts where he's appeared. He to be fair, he was never some any prize. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So, I'm so brave to say that too. By the way, hey, yeah, so how can you like, say I'm something not, so controversial and so brave? I'm not yeah. gonna watch any that Kevin Spacey has been in like from this point, right? Like, I, like that's yeah. definitely out. But there, there was also he was like on. Uh, he did that really creepy. He does his like creepy, um, fucking, um, yeah. like Christmas message or whatever every year. And this yeah. time, uh, this the, time the House he, of Cards character. Yeah, yeah, this time he did his Christmas message with Tucker Carlson. I, I, Tucker Carlson <laughs> weird, weird, weird. I saw that. I was like, oh god. What <laughs> all right. Like? So all right, this is a moratorium on Kevin Spacey. <laughs> Driving ourselves. I, I wanted to say earlier. Going if, back somebody, to if only if somebody had called the call the moratorium um, on Kevin Spacey. Uh, you know, before you did those crimes. So let's shout over the guest. How about KT? What, what do you got? I wanted to go back to what you were asking us about with whether or not people could understand that this is a farce now right because i really felt like it was built almost like an italian farce like a big play where everyone's mm-hmm. acting the they're there these emotions are huge they're flip-flopping lemon is the the shigets and then he's the guy on top and so much of it felt like I, I guess if you're not paying attention to the level where you could think these guys are cool then yeah you probably also miss <laughs> the nuance <laughs> in how much it is set up like a classic farce I really want to sell real estate. These guys are really <laughs> telling me there's a lot that I had learned from this movie. I got to say, I was actually horrified when I met the dudes, and they were dudes, make no mistake about it, young ones at that, that like mm-hmm. just took it on face value as cool guy doing cool guy stuff. And like I was blown away in, in, like, in a way that made my stomach hurt. I was like, oh, 
I, I, no. think, I think an even crazier part of the, the idea that somebody could is that David Mamet did sell real estate for like, that's where he got the idea for this. Right? Oh like, yeah, that's right. He had a, yeah. he had a oh, very wow. short career uh, as at one of these places doing the real estate thing before he was a playwright. And uh, so he's kind of putting his own disdain about this into like the, you know, the story of Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. That's why this movie is actually kind of interesting, but uh, you know, because this man, doesn't have that critique of capitalism that uh you'd think that the movie like you know a movie like this would have where, where you know it's like yeah capitalism is the real villain of the of the story but but uh he doesn't really lay it at the feet at all it just you know it's just it's a it's a byproduct because that's just how it is so so which is fine yeah. i mean I'm not, it's a different story um, and it's not it's, not it's really more the motivator yeah. so, but the fact but the, the fact that that uh you know that he had such a bad time you can that, that disdain is actually shown yeah. through so you can <clears> get that read of uh mm -hmm. you know that leftist read that i just gave well it, it's, know, looking at, it's looking at a, at a super cutthroat uh a super cutthroat and kind of pathetic industry and it's kind of yeah. giving you a showcase of that which real estate if you're doing it at this level is most definitely um i mean it's, it's, awesome. cutthroat, it's cutthroat at all levels but yeah if you're doing it at this level, like it has to be sad and cutthroat. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's, oh, it's, it's murderous and pathetic. So wait, so I have, I have, uh, I have a, a Bobby, Bobby Wine and R. R. Hell yeah. Yes. yes. But, uh, you speak her name. Yeah. Yes. I've, I've, right. so, so I, so and and shout out to, to what somebody who was in the chat earlier. I don't know if he still is, but uh, uh, the person who actually put this clip online was uh, in the chat earlier. Oh yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was cool. at the beginning of it. Um, so this is, uh, yeah, this is. She's. I, I picked the John, the the fucking, uh, the Jack Lemon one, and there was there was one for everybody pretty much. But mm. we we've seen her interview Kevin Spacey before. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yes, that's right. we did. I forgot about that. <laughs> yet, one of these days, there will be something I don't believe exists. The world's greatest actor. I don't believe in that. I don't believe there is one that it was Olivier or Marlon or anybody else. I do believe that that at a certain point in their life, there are a number of actors, really wonderful actors, that given the right part at the right time will give a performance that nobody else can give. That I'll buy. But if there is a greatest actor, I'll tell you what will happen. He'll wanna go up there one night and get an Academy Award, having given a performance in a lousy part with lousy actors around him and a bad director. Now that's the world's greatest actor. <laughs> That will be the best. <laughs> but when a performance really works, somebody laid the bricks, and that's the writer. And in this case, it's David Mamm. Well, the play won the Pulitzer Prize. So it was a wonderful part. They're all wonderful parts. Didn't you think the whole cast was wonderful? Absolutely. I, just, I never worked with a better cast. They're just terrific. On Broadway, uh, who did your role? Who created it? Bob Prosky, I think, played. I did not see the play in New York. And Bob, I adore. He's a friend of mine, and I worked with him. Um, I think that Bob Prosky played it in New York. I saw the play um, in another city, and I forgot what they played it now, because quite a while ago. You know, the play is about five, six years old uh, when it was first done. And I loved it, but I had forgotten who played my part. I remember all the other parts. Maybe it's just that, that I blocked it, you know, out of my mind so I wouldn't do what he did or something like that. When you saw the play, did you say, someday I want to do that as a no, film? No, I did not think of it. I did not think of it. Uh, I just, I loved all the parts. But sometimes you do that. You'll see a play and say, gee, boy, someday I'd love to play that particular part. The, it, but strangely enough, that did not happen uh, in the play. I just enjoyed the whole play. And I didn't think about it uh, from that point of view. I didn't. They, they came to me, but a, it was a good three years ago when I was first approached by Jerry Tukovsky, who bought the rights. And then he couldn't get it made because there's no sex. There's no violence. There's not even a woman in it. There's a hat check <laughs> lady, an elderly hat check lady who says it's wet outside. I think that's all. And that's the end of her. Um all there is is guys. Tell me it's what I again. Tell me like again. Football that's right. Hunt, that's the end of you. Look, it's under the two minute warning, and we're behind by five points. We've got to get over the goal line now. That's what it really is. And it's it's that team of guys fighting and clawing to keep their job. If they don't make a sale by the next day, a couple of them are going to be gone. And that's the desperation of it. And it's uh, it's the character behavior, really, about people that we can identify with 
in a common problem, and that is making a living in this day and age when we're halfway down the tubes. Yeah, man. I mean, the the whole uh, first of all, Bobby in low key mode on that one. That that was almost I'm like, oh, I was, I was, I was like, wow. hoping you would say something inappropriate. <laughs> By the way, whenever you whenever someone says something like you know, make a living in this day and age when we're halfway you know when we're halfway down the tube, I think like I, I realize like you could say that in any age, and it's true. Yeah. You really, like, I feel like at any point, you can be like, yeah, in these days, in these crazy days, and at any point, I'd be like, yeah, these are crazy days. And it's like, wait. Yeah. You can... it's <laughs> like, I just, Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer is such a classic. It's because we're always just halfway there. Yeah, true. <laughs> there you go, there you go. And it's our uh, life. But but the all right enough. <laughs> but the 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 uh, the animal. Who gets love of bad too far. That's this. too far. <laughs> it's, God damn it! Stop funny <laughs> Bon Jovi songs. Uh, <laughs> I, I, amazing to me that we we get to analyze the Alec Baldwin monologue without mentioning the first prize, second prize, third prize aspect. Hey, of can it, I right? can I just say it, it? The 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 first prize, the second prize already jumps down by quite a bit. <laughs> oh, Freems, thank you for the raid, by the way. Appreciate it. You're like, you're like, oh, I get a really cool car. That's awesome. Yeah. Steak knives. Ste- like. Set of steak knives. <laughs> okay, that's weird. And third prize is you're fired, right? Like, and that's one of the most again, when I talk about like it being like so predator and prey relationship. Like what in a situation like that where there's a tenuous your your day to day depends on uh, on how many sales you're making. What what a, like a tenuous like horrible like on your heels situation that is, well, and, and, of and course, it literally does because you're making commission, right? Like you're making right. A, you live you your 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 livelihood depends upon being able to push the quote unquote weak leads that, and, <laughs> that and they the, have. The commission is ten percent of the actual like thing to too, the like. chumps and deadbeats that, yeah. <laughs> that you have, <laughs> and the and the totally I'm sure nice uh, Indian people that. We would never say anything bad about on this podcast. No, never, we're, never. We're, this we're is a pro, very we're, progressive we're, podcast. We're, we're pro. Uh, we're pro Patel on this podcast. Yeah. And it is just as funny as Especially it is Deb. sad. Like <laughs> it's really sad that they have to do this and that somebody's going to get fired. But it's also fucking hilarious that it goes cars, steak knife, you're fired. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Because like, that's well, a new, there's that's a new uh, fuck Mary kill. <laughs> <laughs> cars, steak but, knife, fired. But there's a mm-hmm. brutal, violent elegance to it, right? That that it, that it's like those are the those are the three steps, yeah. and it's something that I think we almost take for granted now because we see those kinds of repercussions and consequences show up in in film now. But they're not presented in such a way. First of all, that just like flows so nicely, where it's like music to the ears, right? But mm-hmm. also oh, not take knives, you're fired. <laughs> I am surprised there isn't a musical version of Glenn Gary and Glenn Ross, frankly, because there's a musical of every other goddamn play. Why not? Uh, I don't give us credit if you do that. Wait, 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 also wait, points. Wait. Give us points. No, I was writing a musical of Glenn Gary and Glenn Ross. <laughs> it's, like, it's copywritten. Don't even try to sue us. It's, it's uh, Glenn Gary and Diana Ross. Ross. <laughs> Shout out to Glenn. John Ross because I, I said that. <laughs> there, there was a. I said Diana oh, wait, Ross. So, so the last thing I wanted to. Um, but but yeah, oh, I was just gonna say like it's amazing that like like how great is that monologue that we managed to 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 analyze so many different aspects of it, and we didn't even touch on like the 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 one two three of that like which is just poetry, <clears throat> really. There we go, Glenn Gary yeah. Powell. That's, that's and, what I was looking for. And again, to go back to <laughs> like being an actor watching this, you can't help but be like what Lemon was saying in that that little clip. Oh, I want to play that. Oh, I want to do that. Like you can watch this and be like, I mean, oh, I want to try out those lines and see what I can bring with it because there's so much we can analyze it so deeply. I, I wish they made six versions of this movie where everybody just swapped to a different role and just, you know. And then, I, I mean, love the idea of the all female version. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. They, just, they just add Tina Fey yeah. as the uh last, last version of this. She's a ball with character. Lemon character. <laughs> so she could so be like, so you'd be like Let's Lemon. See. <laughs> Tina Fey, Kristen Wiig, uh, Maya Rudolph, Maya Rudolph. Yeah, so we got this half halfway cast already. Let's go. Uh, KT, of course, we got to get KT. Of course, Blank yes. Gary, of course. It's, it's Glenn Gary <laughs> Girl Boss. I'll say the Chinese lady in the with the coat. 
No yellow <laughs> cards. We moved Wait, on from I, that. So I have, I have uh, the last thing I want to say about this. I feel like a, a lesser <laughs> movie, right, would do like the rat race thing where they're, they're yeah. like all in competition. I feel like it, it shows David Mamet's strength as a writer that they didn't do anything like that, right? Like, right. You know, the feeling yes. that they're even really in that. competition with each other. Yeah. Yeah. That's not what well, I like, it, interesting. And it's a weird because there's a weird camaraderie, but like not really. Like it's sort of like this frenemy kind of business going on. And depending on who's again, like uh, higher up on the on the thermometer mm. for sales, depending on like their social strata and how people get reacted to. You know, like you get to see the machine be like kind of treated like garbage, like yesterday's news through most of the movie. And then, oh, he makes a big sale, and then oh, he's this big man on campus suddenly. You know, and next thing you know, he's tearing apart Kevin uh, Spacey and you're taking for a service. <laughs> to, to the Nyborg fan, to the, you know, like. Oh, that was one thing I did want to say. Um, did anybody here ever watch the show, the movie Heavy Metal? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's yes. a line in it where one character goes to another character, that's good, Nyborg. <laughs> and the whole movie, anytime it was like Mr. And Mrs. Nyborg, I was like, "Yeah, that's good, Nyborg." That's, good, that's my yeah, only yeah, thing. Where yeah. like you shouldn't watch those movies in that order. <laughs> you guys want to? You want? You guys want to hit the Nyborg? Uh... <laughs> yeah, but bitch, that's my Lochnar. <laughs> really? Yeah. That, those are the Glen Gary leads. Is the is yeah. The... <laughs> Thank you. That's where's that crossover? It, it is, it's also a very it's a very funny thing to do this a robbery, but oh, it would have to have a woman. Sorry, <laughs> but it, it's it's very it's very funny that it's a robbery. But it's but funny. don't worry, she has improbable large tits. Thank you. <laughs> we saved it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like funny. and subscribe, it's everybody. <laughs> like the fact that it's, the fact that that it's a burglary. The fact that it's a burglary, but they took the lead is a very funny thing. Yes, show. yes. Like, because it can only be, it can only be somebody working in that office. Because right, it right. has no value to anyone else. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, you have to imagine there's like a safe, and then he takes the phone, so it's like, oh, look, they, they yeah. took the phone too, so it can't be somebody working in the office. And it's like, <laughs> who else would know that the leads are there? Yeah, like, no, like, <laughs> no one even would know. I yeah. picked the right yeah. episode to wear my I Love Bird shirt, by the way. <laughs> Oh, I thought yes. you were gonna say you picked the right episode to wear your uh your your I love the lead like leads shirt. Leads. <laughs> I love leads. <laughs> love leads. <laughs> mm. Did somebody made an I love lead shirt? I would might I might buy it. I might <laughs> depending on the design. It would depend on the design. <laughs> but it's like oh, it's very check um, out Etsy. Like, they might already have it. It's like such a perfect Probably. like excuse kind of thing, right? Like it sounds like a very it's a very realistic <laughs> excuse that it's the leads. They're like these are really weak leads, and they probably are. Like it's definitely like you know the worst people. He's the kind of person that would put their name down on something like that. It's already like yeah, you're, you're not you're getting crazies, right? Like you're getting people yeah. that uh, are just kind of signing whatever, and they're like oh you know like maybe I'll get a salesman to talk to. So like the fact that uh, the entire thing it's like oh the leads are weak, and it's like the leads are weak. You're weak. You can't sell them. <laughs> Like <laughs> somebody, uh, Ted, I think Ted Ransom, one of the Ted's, like responded on Facebook with the, the stream is weak, and I said the stream is weak. You're weak. <laughs> You're weak. <laughs> it leads itself well to, to like it's, you know. Well, I, what is that no. like? Like par 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 uh, parody quoting? What what, what is the mm. word for that? We do it all the time on this freaking show, but <laughs> we get our top research. Yeah, I can say it. <laughs> like and yeah. subscribe, everybody. <laughs> I don't know why they didn't just go in and copy the leads and leave it and look like nobody was ever stolen or did anything. Yeah, they had invented copy machines at that point, hadn't <laughs> right? they? Right, you mean, have yeah. pen paper right oh, now. Yeah, you, you could write, yeah, you yeah, could write yeah, yeah. each one down. <laughs> they had the whole night. I think Ed Harris is just pissed off and wants to stick it to them, though. Well, that, this is another, so this is another, well, they couldn't make Glenn Gurgle and Ross today. No, because they have phones. You wouldn't need to do any of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> break into the mainframe and steal it from home right nobody no, wants nobody wants to work anymore <laughs> i sure as hell nobody don't wanted to, to be fair i never wanted to work in the first yeah. place Jeez. yeah well i didn't sign up for dealing hard labor at 16. i mean my neck my back everything my whole right side I is like and my crack <laughs> yeah <laughs> Thank it you for saying the KT because I was like I, I can't I can't do that after I did the heavy metal thing. No, There's those no are jokes. Yeah, no, those are jokes. Yeah, you can't tell. As a My woman, bad. I'm allowed to. My bad. Yeah. That's right. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> as a man, Letterbox is of course a place for film lovers to talk at with and to each other about the films that they love, maybe the films that they didn't love, maybe the films they were desperately searching for a woman to, to be involved with somehow, <laughs> way, shape, or form. <laughs> and of course. Yeah. And yeah. Of course 
This is uh, a bottom-up democracy. Everyone gets to have their say. Not just Siskels and Eberts of the world. Everyone gets to opine, chime in, maybe say if something is or is not play-like. Whatever. Everyone gets to have their say. It's best if you keep it succinct. Keep it uh, funny, clever, uh, notable. And, of course, these are collected every week by yours truly for this bit. These are the Letterbox one-liners for Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Let's go. Five stars for Pacino's yelling. Five stars for Alec Baldwin's yelling. Just five stars for yelling in general. As an idea, a concept, <laughs> the art of yelling. <laughs> hoo <laughs> Why does that not is, end with it? it, it there is a, uh, this, this is a peak dudes yelling movie. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. I'm trying to think if there was if there was a better they're entry. Doing, and they're yelling. They're yelling. <laughs> I'm convinced this film is the reason the Bechdel test was made. <laughs> <laughs> Look, all I'm gonna say is it's better to have no women than to have fucking like a woman with like a bad role. Yeah. It's like yeah, it's word. Like, yeah. yeah, don't do it wrong. <laughs> Time for your six o'clock, Mr. Spacey. <laughs> Oh my God! <laughs> More woman tokenism. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's raining, men. It's Hallelujah. raining, men. I, who can't believe that song is written by uh, God, the guy from uh, I can't remember one of the the leads for the late night band, Paul Shear? No, Paul Schaefer. I'll remember it. Paul Schaefer. Thank <laughs> it's you. It's a Paul. It's definitely a Paul. <laughs> but like, Paul it's Simon. raining, men was written by Paul Schaefer, that tiny little ball guy. What? Wow. Wow. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well. And he's straight. Yes. His his wife made fun of him and said that the song would never do well. It's <laughs> raining men. Oh, gotcha. Okay, cool. Well, what what is what is it? The Pacino character says where it's like uh raining hard out there. Like what is he like he does like a <laughs> yes. Well, I yes. forget what it is he does, but I was like translating the song, no less. Like no. the way he in does inflections yeah. in this yes. in this film is is puzzling, cool, it's, and not what he normally does, too. But there's there's also like a weird there's a weird thing in this where he's talking about it in the beginning and he's like, It's hot out there. It's real hot. You know, it's so hot out there. They said a, a guy's walking up to the cop and saying uh, shoot me and then he said and then he's, he's he orders a drink and he's like you know you know what they're saying and he's like they're saying that uh if, if you if, if it's if it's hot outside you need to drink water you need to drink water because you're dehydrated and it's like is that a new study that you just found that out <laughs> right like, exactly did did out did 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 breaking news yeah <laughs> oh. he's like but i i take the opposite of it's like i can i can tell that if, if it's hot outside you need to drink water yeah like that's yeah. that's something that i just intrinsically know didn't Maybe need that bone mod. Thank you. This film may not have passed the Bechdel test, but certainly didn't fail the decibel test. <laughs> yeah. Well played. Well, that's some wordplay. That's good. It's, it's mammoth worthy. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Pacino's best performance, second only to I see Oppenheimer when presenting best picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was dropping a different kind of bomb throughout this. Oh movie. wow, guys, we got we got Al Pacino. Wait, quit making chat. fun of me. <laughs> Sarah, we're so great. Wait, you, you were great in this. You were great in this. Did this did someone uh... Thanks for the Bobby shoutouts. We love Bobby. We celebrate Bobby on this show. Yeah, did did, 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 did Pacino get another woman pregnant that's like twenty, like sixty years younger his, than his him? Wife. His wife. It's his wife. Yeah, it's his. Yes, his yeah. wife. <laughs> Yeah, my wife. <laughs> Fantastic! What a time to be alive. When he, when he, uh, <laughs> when he impregnated her, he screamed, Hoo -ah! All right, all right. <laughs> calm down. I was drinking a coffee while watching this movie because, unlike those losers, I'm a closer. <laughs> Damn straight. I'm a I'm a closer. I'm a, no. I'm a closer. You know, you know it's that kind of coffee. And that's I'm drinking too. my coffee. You know it's that kind of coffee too that's been like reheated. It's just like the coffee from the fucking machine. You know what I mean, like the. Hua! <laughs> <laughs> so you know it's like that. You know it's like that disgusting, like uh, disgustingly strong, acidic, like acidic, yes. uh, reheated coffee that they're drinking yeah. too. Oh yeah, it's not good. No, it's I never knew how badly I needed to witness Al Pacino cursing Kevin Spacey out. Facts. Mm -hmm. Facts. That whole, yeah. the whole, uh, the whole, I don't care whose dick you're sucking. That, uh, or, you know what I mean. That that hits differently. <laughs> well, all right. A bunch of amazing actors repeatedly yelling "fuck" for a hundred minutes. Riveting. I you know, get right, it. Right it's right literally after, right riveting. After I, I I never. It, I was putting this together and I was rewatching it, and there's like, uh, there's one scene where where he just yelled out "fuck," and I was like, "That's true." He it, it, it does. <laughs> it's, like, it does. It's a thing. It is a thing. 
Oh, Jack wow. Lemon just yelled out "fuck" in the middle of like one thing he said, and I was like, "Yes." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like a hostile working environment. Good, <laughs> <laughs> I have to call HR. I, I Forget love, I love calling that Murray. I love that, it's, I love that it's, it's somehow not like normally a hostile enough work environment. They have to call yeah. Alec Baldwin in to make it more hostile for that day. By the way, everyone suck. Uh, seek out Justin's review here and, and give it a like because I thought that was brilliant. That was brilliant. Oh, yeah. the front page stuff. So, thank you. Real estate can sometimes get a little too real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that should have been on the poster. <laughs> That's actually not a bad thing. The, no, right. the real estate might get too real, but the properties are fake. Yeah. Those are the Letterbox One Liners for Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Please, please, please follow the show on Letterbox at our Letterbox <laughs> HQ account at movie night extra where we post stories of all of the great episodes the movies uh, that we do and uh, so much more follow along for our theme month money night extravaganza is what we're doing right now <laughs> we're doing right now uh, i gotta stop looking at the comments when i do this man I just got to. Never. Uh, and we're we're uh we're posting all that up there and so much more so follow us on there follow your host forrest flacco our salesman born or made he's at always flacco you can find out for yourself there by uh, going to his letterbox and uh, I don't you know, all the stuff he's logging. <laughs> well, I put you on the hook for it now, so I guess you got to. I am, of course, M. Conan the Machine Neutron. Fuck you. That's my name. Uh, at Conan Neutron. And you can find me doing the highbrow, the uh, the, the midbrow, the populist fair, all that stuff. Follow me along for the Criterion Challenge as well as film school dropouts. Uh, I'm pretty <laughs> active on there. I think it's fair to say. Uh, Andrew World is over there. I don't know what we're, we're, we're doing something else. I don't know what his nickname is. I love Leeds. Glengarry Bo Glen Gary Bob Ross over there. Uh, J. Andrew World is He's an um, artist. Is an artist. He is an artist, yes. And he is watching all the weirdest stuff so you don't have to. Maybe so you can. I don't know. It's not for me to say, but he's doing it either way. Uh, you know, it's, 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 it's what he does. What he does he's going to tell you about every Doctor Who. Yeah, he, can, he he really can. He's watched them all very recently, uh, and logged every single one of them. Glenn Gary Still Glenn watching Glenn. them. There I'm, I'm in the that's middle right. of a uh, fourth. Hey, Doctor someone's Serial. that's someone's name on Twitter. So, <laughs> I, I I believe it. That's that's that that's a good. If you got that name in like 2010, you'd be stoked, and then you'd be like way less stoked if it was like 2024. <laughs> <laughs> if that was your Twitter <laughs> username, I mean, you're getting worse and worse. You're right, right. It's like, ooh, I should change this. <laughs> uh, Christina Oaks down there, Glenn or Glenda. At Cosmopolitics, she's on Letterbox at um Christina, selectively log in when it suits her. Uh, yeah. but, uh, never any more than that. And and also too, get ready because when we do Wolf of Wall Street, I'ma do a little Naomi cosplay there Duchess of Bay Ridge. That's, that's coming up next week. We no coming, full coming frontal though, because we would get banned. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but that's the only reason why. Yeah, that's that's reason. Yeah. <laughs> Subscribe to the Discord, though. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, all, yeah, all bets are off in there. Uh, KT Baldassaro, uh, she does the movie runtime. I like it just like the cartoon expletive is, is your subtitle. That's pretty good. Yes, it's my name translated into Mamatese. Mam Mamet speak, yes. <laughs> uh, you that's are. The, uh, that's like the Ned Flanders version of uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. <laughs> right, right. Like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, the little de deadly creature. I think, Actually, on I've unified all it? under um, movie runtime on Your movie runtime yeah. on everything. Great, that makes except it so for much Instagram, easier. but that's not here or there. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, oh, and very active linking to all your movie runtime uh, TikToks. Busy, real busy mm -hmm. with the TikToks over there on that, and mm -hmm. uh, so much more. Uh, that's how I found out about Monkey Man, which I quite enjoyed. So appreciate that. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, let's. Uh, I guess let's hear from our sponsor, and then we'll take away with the rest of the plugs with Andy. Tonight's podcast is brought to you by Yebiga, a Balkan rakia spirit plum brandy that brings Serbia to the American shores in an authentic and appreciative way. Care of Billy Gould, basis for faith no more, and rakia appreciator. Rakia is a traditional spirit enjoyed at weddings, funerals, and life events. However, more and more, it's being enjoyed everywhere on a night out with friends or as a casual drink. Get a bottle today in liquor stores and bars across America. Go to yabiga.com to see where it's available near you. There you go. There you go. Glenn Gary, Bob Ross, please, please take it away with the plugs, don't you? All right. If you're watching us on YouTube, please do the YouTube things. Like, comment, subscribe, hit that bell. And, of course, the big ask uh, to let other movie fans find our content. Watch the video to the end. Uh, that allows you to hear that great Kona Neutron song. And, uh, you know, we, we get more uh, viewers, which is 
a wonderful symbiotic relationship that we have. Which equals more money for us. Yes. <laughs> Which we is the point of this guys. Yeah. Um, if you're over on... Uh, uh, Shit. Oh, there we go. You're doing so good. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we Mark just it. Hit to. the time. <laughs> <laughs> we're over on Twitch. Yes, yeah. um, it's not good when the feature guests can do the plugs faster than you can, man. Yeah, I'm just, sorry. just saying. Yeah, I was I was killing it though that first section, but <laughs> yeah, yeah the first wrong. two sentences were aces. All right, yeah. back to one. Yes. We got this. All right, all right. No, this no, 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 no. We are <laughs> live, are we? Yeah, yeah. Yes. No, we're right. not. Yeah. I'll just edit this out later. Um, <laughs> if you're on Twitch, um, throw us a sub. If you happen to have an Amazon Prime account, you can subscribe for free. Doesn't cost you anything, and actually, really does help out the show. So please, mm. you know, uh, support us in any way you can. That way, um, we have a Discord. Find us there. Like us there. Um, uh, plus, we're also on other social media sites. Uh, you can say hi to us on any of those places, like Facebook, Twitter, uh, Blue Sky, uh, Instagram, and Threads. Find us, like us, uh, and, and uh, yeah, we will answer back. But you know, same thing with the Discord. Add us, please. <laughs> That's good. That's good. <clears throat> if you want to support us directly, we do have a Patreon. Um, the Patreon lets you get access to our after parties, which I believe we're doing one tonight. I think Over we're going to gonna here. watch the trailer for the Joker Part Two live and react. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. Nice. And, nice. and we're going to get we uh, we're going to get yeah. Rain Machine stories. <laughs> We're gonna get our, oh, our yes. orders I'm out. I'm gonna tell you about a rain, rain machine. I was like, wait a minute, that's me. Not Shit, you, yeah. me. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, stick around for that. But if you if you're watching this later and you can't watch it uh, because we put it behind the paywall, you can subscribe and be able to watch it, and that do that through our Patreon. Plus, for we get money, which we like. A dollar. Yes, one dollar. One dollar. One dollar bills, y'all. Dollar dollar bills. And of course, Conan Neutron over there is uh, sporting his, um, you know. Uh, branding for his uh, other podcast, Bretonic Reversal, which is a great mu music uh, deep dive conversation with various musicians. Uh, so, so if that's your thing, go check that out. Uh, who, who's coming? Music. Music. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, Gandhi. <laughs> Ooh, uh, Ooh, uh. <laughs> I got a Vegeta of that, didn't I? Ooh, I did. Uh. <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, normally, <laughs> normally Thursdays, eight Eastern, seven Central, six Mountain, five Pacific. I did an episode yesterday with Buzz from Buzz Osborne of Melvins. Uh, up for patrons now, one dollar a month, early access gets you there. Uh, two more episodes this week: Ryan Patterson of Photo Crime and Coliseum, and Rick Sims of the Digits. So, doing uh, all these bangers in uh, the ten year anniversary show is like a week and a half away. So, how? <laughs> Yeah, what is that yeah. podcast here? Two hundred. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's so cool, though, time. man. Congrats. Men used to go to war and die, but not anymore. <laughs> now they do podcasts. Yeah, <laughs> boy, do they! But I wasn't doing it before a lot of these people. So there you go. I like yeah, was, I mean, I like how that was in the Tucker Carlson. Men used to go to war and die, but now they don't. Why not? Today, like <laughs> I know on the next Protonic reversal. <laughs> right, find out. find out this week on Protonic reversal. No, not really. Men used uh, to men used to say hoo ah before they went to war. <laughs> now they do still. But uh, if you if you want to get some more Coda Neutron music, uh, you can yes. uh, check out his band Coda Neutron and Secret Friends. Get it at yes. uh, neutronfriends.bandcamp.com. Uh, and where you can get the latest album, Adult Prom, which is a right. split EP with uh, Lung, which is fantastic. Both Close sides. LP. It's a, it's a LP. Spoiler B. Ah! <laughs> I, I could have not snap corrected you, but I did. I decided to. So, uh -huh. yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, and, and you sell posters left for sale, right? We do. And uh, we also have these tour dates coming up uh, in May. <clears throat> so Madison, Milwaukee, Cincinnati, Louisville, Chicago, Minneapolis. Uh, and uh, of course, part of that being uh, Caterwaul, which I need an update. We graphic, ride at dawn but... is what that poster is saying. You're right. Exactly. I think we're going to I think we're actually going to make a uh, T-shirt of, of this design. People seem to like that. That would be so cute. The uh, evil can evil so character with the yeah on the, on the van. So I think we're going to make we're definitely going to make stickers for sure. We'll see. We'll see how the coffers are looking. See how many, see how many people buy these posters. Posters, then I'll, <laughs> I'll be able to tell you what we're making for. <laughs> anyway, 
Yes, uh, Neutron, yes, Code of Neutron, The Secret Friends is the name of the band, and NeutronFriends.Bandcamp.com is the best place to buy our stuff and support us because it goes directly to us rather than all these uh, walled garden sharecropping streaming services. Thank you. Thanks. And you can still check out Conan on the Third Gear Scratch podcast uh, if right. you want to, uh, which uh, I think just went up last week, right? Yeah, yeah. Alan Epley from Shiner's podcast. I was a guest on that. That was, uh, that was a good time. So I get to be, get to be on the other side of the, the mic now and again, and uh, so to speak. And that was, uh, that was, that was good. That's a, that's a good one. There's a couple other ones coming up as well. Oh, also, I forgot to mention um, last time Pop Life, we're doing the thing, Jason oh, yes. and I, where we go through every uh, a certain years in music. And well, the question, it's very clickbaity, is was blank the best year for music? But it's basically an excuse to talk about records that year. And it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, the third episode of that uh, just went up. Uh, <laughs> Now with less Jason. It was me and Rob from uh, 1001 Album Complaints, and then Jason kind of called into his own show, which is pretty interesting. <laughs> but, this is like something he'd do, though. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely, absolutely a character for him. But it's a lot of fun if you like hearing people BS about records and and especially correcting us on ones that we forgot, then <laughs> boy, is that the show for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the other night I had a uh, I had like a three-hour conversation with Jason on like just Facebook like we were going back and forth mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because um Dan Dan hit me up and was like you know I've had like too many like so many white people on uh on power report and I'm looking like if you know whoa whoa, like, whoa whoa excuse me <laughs> my buddy like, Dan who came down from my birthday said that he was, he was like he was like if you know anyone that's like you know like a like a person of color that would be like you know good for the show and I was like I should like link him up with Jason yeah. So I was like trying to like get the two of them to have a conversation, but but on like two different platforms. So I was like messaging one on Instagram. I was like, right, right, okay, right. okay, here's here's his email. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I know the vibes. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. They live near each other too, so so that'd be fun. But uh, yeah, and Christina, <laughs> mm -hmm. Christina, dead over air, there. Andy. We call him. We'll just edit it out. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, keep going. Just edit it out. <laughs> Fuck it, we'll do it live. <laughs> These are the vibes right now. <laughs> that's it, that's it. Andy is Jennifer Connolly. <laughs> that's exactly always. how it was when I met her too. No, oh, I never actually met Jennifer Connolly. <laughs> but uh, no, Christina's over there um, on Twitch right now, this very yep. second. Um, Christina's yeah. over. Christina's over there. On uh, Twitch. For for those who've been wondering where I am, it's just kind of been hectic. I've been doing like four dog sitting jobs at once, but I've kind of mellowed out. I'm booked completely until June now, so I'm gonna be streaming from all my customers houses oh lord twitch please <laughs> it'll be it would be funny though to be like on twitch and you're like you hired someone to do uh you know like like dog sitting for you and you go and you turn on twitch and like just on the, like home screen or something you're like is that my is that my is that my dog sitter? is that is that my house is that, are, they, are they streaming out of my house I, oh they know they know they know but also too i'm getting a new pc and i'm gonna be making a lot of money these next few weeks into may so i'm i'm excited about that because i want to be gaming and stuff <laughs> Yeah, so get the Max money. It's going crazy because yep. I'm a, I'm assuming Max, the German Shepherd, the German Shepherd puppies are out and about. Probably and wants to be on air like everyone else involved with this show. Yes. He's got piercing blue eyes. He's got them like baby blues Great. like Sinatra. So, so is there anything like, coming up this week? Oh, you mean show? like uh, you mean like Ronan Farrow Senior? Yeah, I, I literally am friends with someone who loves Woody Allen to death and like will defend him and any. A, any given opportunity and they're like i'm like i don't care about what you say about the timeline a one night stand all it takes is one sperm okay one I time thought, i thought multiple that's people it. go that's not that's definitely not uh is it soon Yi? is that who you're talking to <laughs> <laughs> she's, like, she, she's like i was not molested what too soon <laughs> yeah, just never just never talk too late, out. honestly. <laughs> yeah, it's like uh. way too late that joke phoned in from 10 years ago thank you <laughs> 10 years ago um loved it <laughs> Anyways, uh, yeah. So, Why don't so you do the plugs? How about that? How about so critiquing my joke? Well, Christina, so she's on Twitch. <laughs> talking about she's doing the about, Twitch thing. Is there, about, about, uh, is there anything coming up this week on Twitch? Is there anything coming up this week on the show? We're probably yeah, going to go over the Kennedy curse because it's real, and I don't care what people say. Um, so brave. Yeah, and just <laughs> yeah, but it seems like it's not happening to one of the Kennedys. <laughs> oh, that one with the tax? Yeah, that guy. Um, but yeah, we're just gonna chill, keep up with the news and all that stuff. Are you calm? Talk about it? the trailer we're about to talk about, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. Tough mm. crowd. Yeah. <laughs> that dog's voting for RFK Jr. That's 
He's, he's handsome like a Kennedy, that's for sure. <laughs> and uh, KT one? has a lot going on. German Shepherd with had, Aryan um, eyes. Uh, Lauren Chernard, uh, frequent guest on this show, uh, guesting on your show. Uh, frequent enough that you like should it? not have, have wandered over her last name like that. But anyway, yeah. Schwinnard, like the bike. Oh, yeah. is that Chernard? No, I yeah, I asked her as well how to pronounce it because she's on the show, but it's Schwinnard. And she says like, like a Schwinn bicycle. Char Schwinnard. I, I, I thought it was like that was fancy. Sorry, Lauren, Lauren, she, Lauren Char we love you. Char Char she's never coming on again now. <laughs> we still got to do Little Women. Little right? Simon. She's coming a Greta up. Gerwig correspondent. Yep, she's mm -hmm. got to be on it. And Becky Rice coming back for that. That's actually not that far from now. It's like May, right? It's, mm -mm, that's like, that's yeah. in May, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be never mind. Yeah, but I just had her on, and, and, and we talked about uh, Green Inferno and Eli Roth, and I, I know, you, you listen to it. Yeah, we, it's, it's we got into some real interesting stuff about horror and why women, especially, have trouble coming to that type of body horror, and it gets really interesting and fun. If you like listening to women talk about modern horror, it is a good episode. Lots of hmm. people do. Gotta get right me on. on <laughs> I'm told. <laughs> I, I hear I hear there's a lot of people online like hearing women talk about anything really. Little women talking even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you. Yes, thank you. My audience loves me. Here we go. Yes. <laughs> as, as I put Stevie's comment on screen as as my uh, as my art. Thank you. And, and of course we got movie runtime where uh, which is mm -hmm. on TikTok and mm -hmm. uh, the conceit is you watch a movie while you're on your elliptical, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, I do each movie's length elliptical. Although sometimes I will review movies that are out in theaters right now, in which case I just go home and do the duration of the time uh, concurrently because I do want to still be able to talk about stuff like I recently saw Monkey Man and I needed I needed people to know how awesome that particular flick is. Yeah. Monkey I Man is the name of the picture. You're never gonna I believe it. I'm not seeing much on it's Monkey Man all. online. That's that's which is crazy. Like like you it, know, he's offline. Cool. The Monkey Man. <laughs> Monkey Man. Wow, yeah. flattering. It's, don't make a really out here flattering me. <laughs> Monkey and, Man. Uh, Jay Leno story. You're doing a uh, live Monkey broadcast. Man is the name of the picture. <laughs> Go ahead, Andy. <laughs> You're doing a live broadcast on Wednesday, right? Starting at seven yes, with uh, <clears throat> Screen Time uh, Coda. Yeah, Scream Time Kota and I, who's another film reviewer on TikTok, mm. will be going live on TikTok. So if you go to my account, Movie Runtime, you'll see me go live. We're going to rate our top 10 A24 films. Uh, Ooh, you can interact with cool. us. We'd love to hear what yours are. We're just going to talk about why certain things in the A24 spectrum really work and maybe a little bit of what doesn't. But we kind of want to keep it positive because we both really love A24 and what they do. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm excited it's for Maxine. Like 12 Monkey Men. <laughs> Yeah, he's gonna be like, uh, you, know, oh, civil war. Be like, no, you know, a country would never have a civil war. China, please follow me on, 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 on my follow TikTok. me on my TikTok. Um, <laughs> yes, so we'll be doing that tomorrow at seven p.m. Monkey Man was fantastic, by the way. I don't think I actually mentioned it, but I thought that was that was a great movie because I loved it. I'm so glad that you got to see that. I mean, it's a passion piece for uh, Devin Talent. It really was. Yeah, I wouldn't mind monkey. even covering it on this show. And I would claw at you if you do not include me. Yeah, well, <laughs> I will monkey man you. You're, you're monkey man. Yes, it's it's the new objective. I'm very curious. Yeah. I haven't heard of this movie until now. So I'm I'm now that, now that you're saying something about clawing and you're saying something <laughs> about Yeah. It, it's literally like like uh I, I if we did uh, action night extravaganza, it'd be perfect. Yeah. It's like a John Wick with a real with a real deep message into it and it's very it's oh, really I, saying, I mean he almost got himself like, killed while filming this. So, yeah. say it's John Wick but with a real monkey. <laughs> with a no, totally live yeah, monkey. The it's killed at the beginning of it, and that's the, the uh surprise, the surprise. <clears throat> a, it's so much a, better uh, than John Wick, so I don't want to be divisive and uh, like derivative and say oh that it's just John Wick, whoa. but yeah. Something like something like John Chimp. The, <laughs> the God damn. That's your letterbox. You there go watch you. it. You go type that in. Two word review. Uh, John Chimp. <laughs> 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 Uh, I actually did just real quick, Andy, if you, if you don't mind. I, I, I kind of feel like it has more. <laughs> Somebody stole my bananas. I guess they and, them all down. I think it has more to do with like Game of Death, Old Boy in the Raid, personally, than John. Yes. But, yes. Very much so. I think Old Boy. So if you, if so. you know if you know those movies, then you know what I'm talking about. Chip Boy. Yeah. Right. Yes. <laughs> those aren't even monkeys. They're five bananas out of five. <laughs> 
And if you there want to catch KT in person, <laughs> you can at the East Hampton Film Festival. Um, she's going to be hosting yes. a woman in horror panel on Saturday, mm-hmm. the 4th of May. Mm-hmm. May the 4th be with you. May, exactly. May if you're in the uh, Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts area, East Hampton, Mass, particularly, or you can go to East Hampton uh, Film Festival.com and see the links for it, get tickets for it. 7 p.m. that Saturday, we'll be doing a bunch of shorts where all the directors are female. And then I'll be hosting the panel afterwards where you can talk to a few of the directors from those films. And of course, yeah. uh, Chris Chris Ferry mm-hmm. from the festival is coming on to talk about the big short with us in uh, two weeks. Think, right? Awesome. Mm-hmm. Love the guy. Really cool. He'll talk more about the festival then. Yes. So mm-hmm. you can hear all about that. Um, yeah. I'll keep it short. And, and uh, you got a film at the uh, Just Scare Me Film Collective uh, this summer. Yes. So I will be making my short, my first short horror film since Girl in the Basement. Uh, Jared, who is the uh, co-director and cinematographer on that one, does this thing called Just Scare Me. It's part of a film collective out in Burbank, California, where horror directors, and they don't have to just be located there. They can be anywhere in the world, sign up and they agree to make a short under six minutes in 60 days. If you don't, then you owe the group $100. So you're kind of like betting. Betting to get this shit done. And it's it's kind of more of a gym than a competition. Like nobody wins. Everybody just puts stuff together and then they have a premiere for each round. And this particular round will have its premiere. I I believe it was June 8th is what I told you. June 8th. Yes. Yeah. So you'll be able to see my next short horror film, which hasn't even been shot yet. Then. Right. Yeah, and if so, if you're in the, in the LA future, area, where we're all gonna live. <laughs> mm-hmm. If you're in if the LA area, people. check that out. Uh, you know, I will be telling people about it to go check it out. I think Thank would enjoy you. it. And of course, you still can find KT on the Starwell Foundation, which is that mm-hmm. uh, podcast uh, drama about supervillains. Mm-hmm. And you got mm-hmm. a podcast season coming up, like a beast. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Uh, we're filming the next season right now. I'm going in and doing How Crime, so you'll get more of it. It's, it should be fun. I'm uh, going to try and audition for a couple additional characters, maybe come at you with more than just the few that you've been hearing from me so far. Which is Excellent. good. I, I listen to you, you, you should do like, like one of those, like, I'm a voice actor uh, TikToks or whatever. Like, that'd be funny too. Sure, one sure. Of, one of the characters should just be Al Pacino. You know. Hoo ah! Yes, I, 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 I do have such a good Pacino. Such a great one. Uh, I did actually do my first skit TikTok yesterday, practicing for the Just Scare Me thing. I, I I wrote a script. I did a little thing. So you know, you can check it, out it that. It was a uh, saltburn. Uh, <laughs> it was a reaction to yeah. yeah. It was a saltburn mm-hmm. review. Because uh, I have this thing where every Monday, another filmmaker on another film reviewer on TikTok will assign me a film and I'll give them a film and I got Salper and I was like, oh shit, what am I going to do? <laughs> there you go. Look the bathtub <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah. You will not see that in that particular skit, but I will keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's paid content. Yes, yeah. that's behind the page. <laughs> that, that's yeah. uh, the really only thing. Hi, I'm KT from uh, Movie Runtime, and I'm standing in a graveyard right now. You'll never <laughs> believe what happens now. <laughs> Welcome to my only films. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all my plugs. Yeah. <laughs> you just got sulper. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Very good. That I has to be it, right? Is there yeah. Yeah. I, I don't. <laughs> wow. 30 minutes of plugs, guys. We did it. <laughs> we <laughs> did it, guys. We saved the city. Um, <laughs> KT, do you have final thoughts about this movie or. Any of the plugs, I guess. That we just I, no, final, th- final thoughts on this movie. For someone who literally thought this movie was the Headsucker Proxy and had already seen this, yeah. I am so, so gobsmacked by how incredibly good this was. And I feel like if you too have not yet seen this movie, for whatever reason it may be, you should definitely put this on. It's free on so many different services and wildly yeah. available. It's not that long. Just watch it. It was. It's really quite good. <laughs> it's, uh, it's wildly available because it can't. It can't close anywhere. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Christina, let's hear some final thoughts. Yep. As someone who's familiar with the play first, I have to say this is a terrific adaptation of it. I think. I mean, some parts have an H well, but this is a stellar cast. You can't find a better cast. Like for like. Any movie that's like related to this. Um, now people I seriously... need to tell that call you on the phone. 
um, but yeah, great, great film. Highly recommend it. Uh, if, 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 if you know, if there's like a local like play production of Glen Gary Girl Lost, highly recommend seeing it and then seeing the movie. Compare, contrast, take notes. They're very Love different. It. Like not, not in a bad way. They're just very different. I was I was surprised by how different they were. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> 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 anyway, uh very Andy, serious podcast, uh, guys. <laughs> like and subscribe! Movie Night Extravaganza! Well, I, I like the fact that anybody listening to this as a podcast is going to think there was like a visual gag, and there wasn't. No, there was yeah, no visual no, gag. Yeah, we're just like, what? Just enamored of her own genius. Me especially. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I got to say, like, it was actually nice to kind of revisit this movie because um, after working sales, I was kind of burnt out from this film because it was used in terrible ways. And, uh, uh, you know, I just always cringe anytime I hear anybody say always be closing because of, uh, you know, just just bad memories. And um, really, you know, sales does make, you know, does kind of drain people of their humanity to do terrible things. And I think that that's really what the subtext of this film kind of gets at. And I'm very happy that that it uh, is able to tell such a good story with a phenomenal cast and just great monologue after monologue after monologue and giving every character a moment to shine which very few films actually get to do yeah usually you know he gives them like a few seconds like the, the, the character i feel like they got the least time to shine was fucking uh alan arkin's character in this but this one i know and i love alan arkin <laughs> but I, I he's so good the character just repeats everything the other person was saying. So what right. would his moment to shine be like? He has to finally come up with his own. Uh, he closes, he closes <laughs> the sale. <laughs> he just like starts hey. quoting shit here. <laughs> he, he can't. He can't. He can't close the sale because every time he just repeats whatever the customer just says. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. That's solid. That's Conan, good. final thought. Yeah, man. So deliciously vicious. Uh, pound for pound, might be one of the greatest performance and awesome monologue movies of all time. And definitely one of the highest echelons of dudes rock energy. I think this very effectively outlines the destructive force of a corporate machine and the weaponization of a bunch of no hopers basically convinced they're temporarily embarrassed millionaires and the illusion of success that drives people to desperate measures and a special shout out to a career best performance by lemon, Jack lemon as the absolutely pathetic Shelley, the machine Levine, uh, just one of my greatest performances of all time one of my favorites and uh, endlessly quotable as the chat <laughs> showed us and in my top 20 movies of all time so what a what a thrill to be able to have this lovely discussion on it mm-hmm. all right well we're gonna be in the after party in a few minutes uh mm-hmm. stories out. about rain coming at you real soon that's me closing <laughs> that's me closing the show always always be sweet Get the money. Money. We want